So we're recording here. That's awesome. Uh, it'll be a great resource, I think, for a lot of people to share. I hope I hope you guys can uh, make the most of this. Um, it's my intention to make sure that everybody leaves with something today. Maybe some of you will leave with a greater understanding, and maybe somebody will learn just a tip or two. Either way, we'll consider that a success. Um, so I think what we're going to do here real quick, I got to set up my screen so I'm not on both screens. Uh, let me see here. Bear with me while I fiddle through this Zoom setup on my computer. I have two monitors. I want my talking notes on one monitor, and then we'll be sharing my main monitor once I get into the uh, uh, slideshow. Okay. Slide decks. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and call this to order since uh, <clears throat> I don't think uh, Andy's going to be able to join us or he'll be joining late. And uh, just uh, for a little introduction, uh, Bob, would you introduce Mike and tell us how you ran into him? And <laughs> You know, Terry, you had 30 minutes to tell me that I you were going to do that to me. So, <laughs> and you failed to do that. So thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, okay, I'll introduce Mike. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, gave, I gave a clinic in, in September where, where I talked about how Tyler and John uh, Hartman and I went to uh, uh, Evanston for the Free Moen meet there, and Evanston, Wyoming for the Free Moen meet. And um, uh, we had the great good fortune while we were there to meet among other people, Mike. And Mike gave this weathering clinic and also Mike, um, Mike was gracious enough to let Tyler and I um, uh, operate on his yard, uh, CSI, uh, California Steel, Steel Industries. Industries. Yep, and um, that was good fun. And, and we thought it would be good. Uh, you know, Mike's weathering clinic was really good. We, uh, we thought that it would be a great thing to share here with the division. Um, I know I learned some things and I'm looking forward to hearing it again so that um, um, uh, I will hopefully pick up more. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mike and Mike, you can tell folks about yourself and then dive right in. Okay. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for the invite. I'm, I'm very flattered uh, that you invited me to, to present this material to you guys. Uh, it's it's going to be a fun little morning here. Uh, morning for me, afternoon for you guys. And I, I hope the weather is kind to you today. Uh, so as, as Bob mentioned, uh, I was uh, invited to present this weathering clinic at the uh, Evanston meet. Uh, and uh, we had a very good attendance and it went pretty well. So uh, this is the third time I will have presented this material. Uh, the first time was to Inland Pacific in Southern California. A uh, bunch, of, bunch of fun knuckleheads down there that do freelance modular in N. And that was my gateway into Fremo. Um, I had uh, jumped into the hobby in around 2007, serendipitously. Uh, 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 I helped the buddy move. Uh, we were hanging out in the hobby shop and I saw Cotto's GG1 in the showcase. And that was an absolute touchstone to growing up as a young boy, my, my dad. We, we, I was born on Long Island, New York. My, we, we had the obligatory uh, line L O gauge in the basement and uh, hours of fun watching that GG1 uh, go around the track. And so there it was an end scale and I just wanted the locomotive uh, as a desktop tchotchke. And uh, I helped my buddy move and that was, uh, I, unbeknownst to me, he, he went back and bought that for me as a thank you. And, and so there it was. And then then we went to a train show at the Anaheim Convention Center, um, and uh, they had the scratch and dent sale with the entire Broadway Limited rolling stock set, so I had to buy it, and thus was my entrance into N-scale railroading. Uh, never wanting to do anything halfway, uh, I, at the local hobby shop, they had a little sign on the counter that said weathering clinics, and I thought, well, gee, if I'm going to do this, uh, it seems like weathering is an important aspect to upping our realism, uh, not only for the rolling stock and the engines, but for the scenery and for the structures that are on that set. So I signed up. It was a four-part clinic, four Saturdays consecutively. Um, it was an A and a B, uh, and then there was a follow-up, and then there was a hands-on, and uh, the class was uh, really well attended. So, um, yeah, 
uh, our teacher there, uh, I have to preface this as well, credit where credit is due, uh, Robert Tico was our instructor at uh, Milepost 38. And, and so uh, I don't know if he'll ever actually see this, but uh, Bob was our, our instructor. Uh, we had such a great time in the class. Uh, several of us were invited to meet at his house on a subsequent Saturday. And uh, there were about eight of us at the time. And we started meeting once a month on a Saturday from eight until noon locally in Southern California. And that click of weathering fanatics, we met religiously once a month for about five years, six years before one person moved away. And then we, we, we still kept moving. Uh, sadly, one of the group died off. Uh, he had a stroke. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was an actor. <laughs> he uh, he played the king at the local uh, uh, what was the, 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 the those restaurants where they they have the uh, the knights of the round table jousting at each other while you're eating dinner. And so we called him Mister the King. Uh, Lawrence was a fantastic modeler, and Lawrence brought into our fold a lot of military. Uh, I don't know if I can rustle up the images, but he did a Japanese zero that was just phenomenal, uh, unbelievable. Uh, a lot of the techniques that Robert Tico brought to us were, uh, have been uh, major practices in the military uh, hardware scene for 20, 30. Uh, some of these techniques go back 40 years. And in, in this whole process that we call weathering, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a general rule of thumb the model railroaders have been behind the trends of the military community by about 20 years. So I think more and more of those techniques have trickled into the model railroading community. So we've closed that gap and the things that model railroaders are doing now have really closed that gap to be about, a, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing these days, we being the model railroading community, a lot of what we're doing, uh, we owe a little bit of thanks to the military uh, knuckleheads that are doing amazing work, uh, just absolutely uh, trombloy, the French term for fool the eye, uh, absolutely uh, fooling the eye into looking at a military model and, and thinking that that's as photorealistic as you can get. And they're doing it at several different scales. Uh, their dioramas are amazing. The models are just absolute jaw-dropping. And of course, here's the difference between military scale modelers and the model railroaders. They'll spend hours and hours and hours on, like, really, on one model. And, and model railroaders, perhaps for two reasons. Model railroaders are into the activity of railroading, okay? It's not just simply let's paint it, let's model it and, and set it on the shelf and admire it. We get in there and we run, we have operations, we run prototypical operations, we run to time clocks, fast clocks. Uh, we, have, we have very elaborate uh, uh, meets where we have several people that are, we're moving freight and we're moving cars like a real railroad, real, railroad would do. So that, that alone kind of gives you the reason of the difference in attitudes about somebody willing to spend a couple of hours or dozens or hundreds of hours. Um, and, and, and so somewhere in there is a balance, right? Uh, you're not, I, a couple of opinions I'm going to throw out here, and they may be abrasive to some people, but you're not going to get great looking model railroading if you expect to do a car in 15 minutes and be done with it. Okay. Now I'll, I'll touch on this topic a bit later on. So I'm a little ahead of myself here, but there'll be a bell curve. For your newest equipment, your average equipment, average age, and your oldest equipment. And there's a distribution on that bell curve as to where you're going to have very, very new equipment that's going to look shopped, newly painted. I'm going to, I'm going to get into this here shortly when we get to that part of the lecture. But um, and, and so along with that, you know, you're going to have these old rust buckets and extremely detailed weathered subjects. And that's where you're going to invest your time. And when you distribute those accordingly throughout a train, throughout a consist, it starts to tell a realistic story. You've got not just a string of plastic toys that are on the rails. Now you've got interest to the eye. You've got contrast between a very old rust bucket and something that's middle of the line time-wise uh, being trailed by something that looks fairly new or, or recently shopped or recently repaired or, or patch painted. 
So that's where we want to be. And, and uh, no surprise, the more detailed the weathering is, is going to be, the more time it's going to require. Um, and as a rule of thumb, you want to put your time where the subject's warranted, OK? Uh, do you want to spend eight hours weathering a hopper? Maybe not. Do you want to spend eight hours weathering a locomotive? Absolutely. And we all know that when a real train goes by, the first thing we do is we pay attention to the hog. That's where the cameras are. Uh, unless you're looking for photo subjects or you're looking for that really rare um, paint job for that, that road that's been on the line for 50 years and it's still running, you know, or 40 years and it's still running and you want to capture that, hey, look what rolled through the yard today, uh, you know, and you want to replicate that look, then that's where your eight hours are going to go. And I'm using eight hours as a very loose rule of thumb. So anyway, that's uh, uh, where we're coming from. That's where we're going to go to and, and let's get to it. Um, by the way, I know you guys are, I, you're probably not all Ford people, but uh, I'm a very foul, proud Ford owner. So I, I thought I would wear my shirt today to uh, placate to the whole crowd. <laughs> um, some, uh, some basic rules, these are all in the handout and I'm gonna be talking to the handout here. So or reading from the handout just to keep me on track. So there are a couple of rules. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to uh, hit on, 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 the, on the broad strokes here. Strive for realism. Um, don't, uh, as, as a friend of mine and the, the, the guy who bought me the GG1, he uh, is a show set designer for Disney and, and Universal. And, uh, and, and uh, when he was at a studio in, in, in Disneyland, at Disneyland uh, in, in uh, Southern California, he used to say, there was somebody that used to say, oh, that's good enough. Um, it's not just good, it's good enough. You know, no, we don't want good enough. We want very solid work done. That's going to be your payoff. Um, good enough is just taking one color paint and nailing everything with it and when you do that it's not going to look real it won't look like a toy anymore but it's not going to look real it's not going to be convincing to the eye even if you're at that end scale three foot rule and your equipment's rolling by and and you, you think that no one's going to really see it in the middle of a consist the overall picture will tell the story it's not going to look real so um strife realism when you can um, uh, and rule number two on my list is when you can work from a photograph, you've already got a blueprint right there of exactly what you need to do. And, and it's a sort of a moment of truth, if you will. So refer back to that photo whenever you can grab a subject photograph, uh, railpix.net and all those different sites where you can find just about anything, any road number. Uh, and it'll give you a great realistic uh, image of what you're striving for. If you don't find the exact one, the exact photo for what you're modeling, at the very least, get one that's similar and go for that. What you don't want to do is fall into the trap of doing what I call intellectual weathering. You're weathering from your imagination and you think it's going to look like this. It's never quite as good as working from a photo. Uh, unless you've got lots and lots of experience and you can fake your way through patch painting and some rust weeps. And I don't recommend you do that because I've made every mistake you can make weathering from the imagination. Use a photo when you can. Um, let's see, uh, be patient, don't take shortcuts. Um, rule number six, don't be penny wise, pound foolish. What do I mean by that? I have ruined models trying to save uh, a $1.79 jar of tester's paint to reuse it, you know, oh, I don't want to waste my paint. It, let's be realistic. It's $1.79 of paint, and I'm working on a $32 piece of rolling stock or a $135 uh, locomotive, okay? I've ruined models being penny-wise, pound-foolish. Don't do it. Get fresh paint brushes. Make sure your thinner is clear and clean. Make sure your paint is good and it's not old. Throw it out if it's old. Don't harm the mission, don't harm the model to save a couple of pennies. It's not worth it. Um, what else? Uh, sneak up on, on the processes. Don't just try and nail it all in one shot. Impatience is something that a lot of model railroaders are guilty of. We, we, we've got 80 pieces of rolling stock to get through, and I've got, I've got four hours on this Saturday afternoon. I'm going to do all 80 cars. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. Take your time. Make your goals realistic. Uh, you got four hours. Okay. Um, gosh, uh, half an hour per model. That's going to get you, you know, think about it that way. 
think about it in terms, eat the elephant one bite at a time. Don't try and do your entire railroad in one evening or, or you know, gee, I'm gonna finish the whole thing this month. Be realistic. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, rattle cans, rule number eight, just say no. Uh, I know this is, this is largely offensive to a lot of people. Rattle cans are quick, they're, they're inexpensive and they save some time. Um, but here's why I say no to rattle cans as opposed to an airbrush. And when we get to airbrushing, I'm a two action guy. And I'll tell you why. It's all about control. I'm a massive control freak. Rattle cans, you can't control the flow. You can't control the spray pattern. You can't control the pressure. Most importantly, you don't know the chemical makeup of what's inside that jar. Okay, Krylon does. Some of the hobby guys like Tamiya, they know what they have in there. But you don't know how that's going to react with isopropyl alcohol. You don't know how that's going to react to a thinner. You don't know how that's going to react. Uh, probably it won't react badly at all to something like an acrylic paint. But if you start working with solvents, I, I've seen, uh, you all know television and uh, television is Michael Gross and, and he's in Tremors and, and Kirk, Kirk Number. He was in my little weathering clique for a long, long time. Michael and I are friends. And I, I don't throw his name around to be starstruck. He is a very serious, very accurate, very precise modeler. And his weathering is absolutely phenomenal. Always at the tip of the spear in our class, in our group. Um, and, and he ruined a boxcar one time because he had, uh, <laughs> it became an experiment in chemistry. It was a goo, it had finished in this and this, the clear of that and the Krylon. And, he went on top of it with a, with a tester's wash, and uh, it was a nightmare. Uh, and it was another time he had a thumbprint on a, on a caboose. <laughs> it was, uh, CSI, crime scene investigation, you know, he, uh, he, we'll, get, we'll get to this wearing gloves and keeping your models clean and free of oil from your skin. But there it was on the side of the caboose. There's, there was this thumbprint, and clear as a bell. So, you know, throw that one away and start over again. Um, so <clears throat> rattle cans, just say no. Lastly, remember, this is a hobby. This is a pastime. It's supposed to be enjoyable. It's, it's a place we go to to relax. It's a place we go to for pride of accomplishment. So uh, don't, don't kill yourselves. Um, avoid, uh, avoid the good enough syndrome. Um, it, there comes a point in time when you want to call the model done. And, and that's fair enough. Um, sometimes you can overwork a model as well. And you want to avoid that trap as well. So um, I'm going to take a quick coffee here. Uh, are there before I proceed into the real meat of the matter here? We're going to we're going to talk about that bell curve here in a moment. Um, I'd like to hear from you guys. What are your subjects? Uh, are uh, is there an interest in scenic weathering? Is there an interest in structural weathering in addition to, to rolling stock and locomotives? I see a lot of mics that are muted. If anybody has a question, un unmute your your mic, please, and jump in there. Yeah, Mike, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, some structural also. Okay. I'm going to take a quick notes here. Structural. Yeah, I'm along with Ron on that, too, uh, structures as well as rolling stock. Okay. My limited experiences with coal hoppers, and I've been a little bit too chicken to do my locomotives yet. Very good. That's not too. That's not uncommon. Other, other questions. So structural uh, coal hoppers is a point. Um, we'll talk about locomotives. Absolutely. The. The, the, the biggest, not getting ahead here, but the biggest uh, fear I had about locomotives is taking them apart and, uh, you know, getting in there. You have to. Yeah, you, you have to take them apart. That you, it, it, I tried to do it the other way and it, bad results. Okay, I'm going to try and share a screen here real quick. Um, let me see here how I can do this. Uh, Let's see, as, as we proceed on into the clinic, uh, if, if you're unmuted, uh, if you'd mute right now, that would be good. And if you have a question, unmute and feel free to ask at any time. Yeah, please jump in, guys. Uh, you know, we, 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 I want you to get the most out of this. And, and I find that we all learn from each other's questions and experiences. So this is not all about me. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Where... Mike, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. 
Yeah, Andy Keeney here finally got in. So glad I could make it. Um, I'm interested in track weathering also, if you have any specifics for that. Absolutely. Great, great question. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to see if I can zoom in here a little bit. Uh, so what I'm sharing here is in the document. I just want to highlight it here momentarily. So not seeing anything. You're not seeing it at all? Oh, okay. I have to hit share. I have to hit the magic button that says share. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, what we're attempting to do here is create, we're, we're using terrestrial effects, atmospheric effects, wear and tear. Um, that's what weathering is all about. And that applies to structures. It applies to rolling stock and locomotives. It, it applies to track. Um, but specifically for the fleet of rolling stock and locomotives, this is my graphic uh, to try and, and, and speak to the, the bell curve of, uh, you know, you've, you've got a coal drag and it's got 80 cars in it, or it's, it's got 40, whatever the length is. Um, a fair amount of reality, if, if anybody has spent any time trackside, uh, any, any fair amount of time, you'll notice this to be relatively true. Uh, as cars get old, they're replaced with new cars. As cars get damaged, they're repaired. Uh, equipment gets shopped and repainted. Seldom does anybody shop and repaint an entire piece of rolling stock unless it's a really specialized piece of rolling stock. So what happens is the rolling stock is out there for 20, 30, 40 years, maybe longer, uh, and it's just left to, to the elements. It's left to its task at hand, and it's going to get beat up. So addressing that <coughs> excuse me and how that and how that works into uh what we see here uh the the the, uh, the bottom axis is the the number of vehicles i'm sorry vertical is number of vehicles and the degree of weathering runs across the horizontal axis I'm choking on some dust here so 15 percent on the new side very clean 15 percent on the aged very distressed rust buckets, end of life, end of life cycle. And, you know, that, that 70% in the middle is where you can have some fun telling a story. Uh, the, the, the fun really yeah. is, is on either end. Go ahead. Was there a question there? Okay. Um, so the, the new stuff takes care of itself. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about that. How do you take a brand new out of the box model and uh, you want to remove the toy plastic sheen from it. And uh, really there's not much that's required other than that. We'll, we'll address that shortly. Uh, the old rust buckets uh, beat up uh, a lot of wear and tear. <coughs> Excuse me, man. And then uh, varying degrees. So not everything's gonna look the same and you, and you wanna avoid everything looking the same. And to that note, uh, let's, let's just use the coal hoppers as an example again. If you've got 40 coal hoppers that you wanna take care of, don't do all 40, don't do 20 at once. Try and do eight or 10 at a time. Uh, and even within that little batch of eight or 10, so you're really kind of addressing like 20% of your, your, your total amount of cars right there. Don't assembly line the process. I, I, I like assembly lines because it's efficient. It saves a lot of time and you can, you can get there. But don't forget in that assembly line process, you don't want a cookie cutter and have everything look the same. Take some time once you've done that, you, you, you've assembly lined, applied these processes to eight or 10 cars, set them aside and you know, uh, do the next batch. But then you're gonna pull a few of these and you're gonna go deeper with, the, with, with, with some effects and you're gonna vary it up. And maybe this one's got some graffiti or this one's got a great dent on the side or, or it, it took a side swipe at some point and they never really repaired it but it's producing a lot of rust from that from that scraper that that you know those are the kind of details that make a car stand out from the rest of the drag the rest of the uh, the, the consist so that's what we want to do here um, with uh, with respect to this bell curve and the same thing applies to your 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 locomotive fleet unless there are very circum very specific circumstances um, you know you, you look at some of the big class A railroads and and uh, uh, you're going to see that you've got old, old 
rust buckets that are, you know, but they get shopped, right? But at some point they're old and they're beat up and they're rusted and they don't look so good. And that's when they go in and they get shopped and they come out all nice and clean and shiny. Um, and so it's, it's, it's nice to have those varieties uh, on the tracks. Um, I'm gonna scoot ahead here. Okay, so that's, that's the overall theme about aging your fleet. Uh, in terms of aging your structures, um, I, I, I think we're not, we're not necessarily looking at the same rules that apply to the rolling stock and to the fleet of locomotives. Your buildings are all going to have uh, mostly terrestrial weathering. All right? there, might be, uh, there might be some graffiti, uh, but it's not like we have damage. Um, it, it, it's, it's mostly terrestrial. So that's, that's, that's rain, that's sleet, that's snow, that's sun damage. Um, and, and another thing too, by the way, talking about structures, a lot of people neglect the roof. And when you are a model or looking at a, at a, at a diorama, you're looking at the scene that you're, if, if, if the scene is the stage and the rolling stock and locomotives are the actors, don't overlook the detail on top of that roof. Uh, Roofs tend to get sun bleached. Uh, grab a great source at looking at roofs, Google Earth, Google Maps, and look how gray things go. All right, everything gets sun bleached up there. So uh, again, work from photos and, and really age that stuff. Also on the roofs, while we're talking about structures, don't neglect where water puddles up, right? There's always dark spots and stains from water rain or, or air conditioner uh, uh, condensation drip lines that, that, that puddle up and, and they habitually puddle up in the same locations. Notice what the water damage does to the rooftops and then go apply that to your rooftops. If you have flat factory roofs, if they're angled, look at where you've got water constantly running down and that's where you're going to have a different fade. You're going to have different color treatment uh, and that technique to do that on a roof is going to be nearly identical to how we're going to do rust weeps. And we're going to get to that here shortly. So let me, uh, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, let's keep this moving. Um, track is going to be all the same. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about track here shortly. Um, okay, we're going to back up here a little bit. I'm going to take us off of screen sharing here uh, and screen sharing, stop share. There we go. Okay. So Basic preparation of any of the subjects. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's talk about a box car right out of the box because this will typ typically be what, what you're going to encounter. From the factory, uh, even from somebody like scale trains, there are still some factory gremlins on there, chemically speaking. Uh, so if you're going to weather a piece of rolling stock, the first thing you want to do is you want to take the trucks off of it, take the wheels off, or leave them on for this step. Get your sink, a little bit of lukewarm uh, to cooler, and don't, don't make it hot. Plastic doesn't like heat. Lukewarm water and a couple of drops of uh, dishwashing detergent. And take that model as is, just dunk it in the water, swish it around, maybe take a, uh, a little painting sponge or, wait a minute, here they are. Cosmetic sponge. Oh, uh, that's nice. Thank you very much. It's there. Ah. <laughs> Cosmo, <laughs> anything that's white for some reason is getting blotted out. There we go. If you can see that, mo oh, man, my, my auto background there. There we go. It's just a very, very fine cell foam. And they're used as cosmetic application. Um, you can find it in any five and dime store. You can find it in any Rite Aid. When you get these, make sure they don't have lanolin or some kind of skin conditioner on them because all you're going to do is reapply that to your model. But take one of these and wipe down the sides of the model a little bit with it, you know, and, and clean. And what you're getting off there is you, anything that any paint residue, any uh, decal uh, process that, you know, a lot of decals are stamped on from the factory. Sometimes there's mold release on the plastic, especially the undercarriages, wheels, Delrin wheel sets. Delrin by itself, the plastic the trucks and wheels are made of, uh, is uh, inherently chemically, uh, it doesn't want anything to stick to it. 
So it's a whole other treatment, but you still want to rinse that stuff off and remove any mold release. Then you take the model, take the wheels off, take, take the truck pin out, you know, let it dry. If you want to boost that with your airbrush, uh, spray some air in there, get all the water out, make sure there's no water stains on there, water, uh, hard water deposits, uh, dry it with, with paper towel, sit it aside, let it sit. That's really, really important. Once you prep the model like that, whether it's structure, whether it's rolling stock or locomotives, whatever, uh, from now on until you're absolutely 100% done with this model, where uh, we'll get some, uh, we'll get some leather, uh, leather, uh, we'll get some uh, rubber gloves. Um, these are from Home Depot. It's just one of the kinds I have. Nitrile is the word I was looking for. Nitrile. Uh, it's very good with working with other chemicals, and uh, they're very inexpensive. Again, don't be penny wise, pound foolish. Uh, and when you put these gloves on, this is going to sound like completely ridiculous, but we're, what we're doing is we're protecting skin oil from getting on the model. So when you're done for the session, you put your finger in, you say, you can reuse the glove. Well, that would just split on me. You can reuse the glove, but if you're going to reuse the glove, how do you know which is inside or outside? So literally, I take, I take the glove and, and I'll, I'll write R or L. And it's not because I'm dyslexic or that I don't know my right from my left, but it's so that I know the outside from the inside of the glove. Okay. So yeah, this one just disintegrated. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Okay. So wear the glove until you're 100% through. Believe me, the Michael Gross story, it's happened to the best of us. Uh, Thumbprint on the side. Yeah, it, that'll ruin your day. It'll absolutely take the wind out of your sails and you'll probably swear off weathering altogether. Don't, don't do that. Um, okay, you've dried the shell. You're going to wear gloves all the way through. Um, and again, work from accurate color photos, Okay. Uh, I know that sometimes we get photos that are from uh, another era, and that's okay. Uh, do what you can, but use a photo. Uh, so the basic weathering process, and this is going to apply to rolling stock, locomotives, and structures. Uh, you, you wash and dry. Then you mask off areas as necessary. Um, uh, use, an air, uh, use the airbrush uh, to start. And this is the important thing. I take the factory model as is, and I start by sealing the entire model with a matte acrylic finish. There's two types that you can go with. Uh, where are we here? And where's my Vallejo? Ah, uh, yeah. I don't have my Vallejo on top of my desk. Somebody told me that you can't get this stuff anymore. Uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right, hang on a sec, guys. I got to get in here and turn off my background. This is getting in our way. Stand by. Any, any questions while I'm doing that? Anybody got any? Let's see here. Where are my... I guess to get an idea of how things are distributed with, the, with age would be useful to be trackside and, and either take movies or watch uh, something like uh, Virtual Rail Fan or other cams that we can find access to and uh, see what's actually out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Th that is, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, there's my messy studio. That's what I was trying to hide from you. Um, <laughs> Looks yeah, normal. <laughs> it's, it's a busy, it's a busy desk as you can see back there. I mean, we got a lot of stuff going on. I have, I have shrink tubing back here in the corner from when I was doing the wiring on California steel industries. Okay. So, this is Model Master matte acrylic. Uh, it's it's an acrylic. Um, you thin it down. Use Model Master's acrylic thinner. Uh, Bob Tico taught us to use isopropyl alcohol, and uh, all of us students in our little clique there, uh, we were ashamed to share with each other at first that we were having all sorts of weird crazing issues and the isopropyl alcohol was flashing off and trying before the model master acrylic would do its job on the model. And we were getting milky white frosted finishes. And until we finally kind of said, hey guys, is anyone else experiencing this? And everybody went, yes, ah, you know, frustration. 
So uh, I swore off the alcohol, uh, thinning this with alcohol, and I, and I went to the Model Master uh, thinner, and problem solved. Vallejo makes a thinner. Uh, excuse me, Vallejo makes an acrylic sealer as well. And uh, my my uh, Disney Universal designer buddy there swears by the Vallejo. I actually haven't tried the Vallejo. Um, that whole thing about yeah, I, I I know it works for me, and I don't want to get out of my swim lane. So he got tired of arm wrestling with the model master, and he went to the uh, Vallejo. So you 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 seal the entire model. All right, what this does is it gives you a baseline protection for the color, for the decals on there, and it. Uh, what you've done is you put a plastic shrink wrap around the entire subject, okay? Why? Because we're gonna come on top of that with some solvents, we're gonna come on top of that with other effects, and we want a good foundation that's not gonna harm the base plastic and the base colors, okay? We wanna control what the color does. We don't want necessarily chemicals to do that because you're going to get some surprise finishes and you're not going to be happy with those surprises so you need to uh mask off the windows that have glazing if if it's a locomotive or a caboose if you can take the glazing out okay if you can't take the, the and i know that sounds arduous but i've tried the masking and um <laughs> uh masking in itself can be a nightmare uh, night, uh, a nightmare that might force us into the, oh, that's good enough, lull of sense uh, of, of false security. And then you, you, you're doing all these brush on effects and airbrush, and then you peel that mask off and you're like, ah, the window. Uh, so if you can get in there and pop the shell and get the glazing out, I highly encourage you. It's worth it. Okay. Especially on a locomotive. Okay. Um, enough said on that. So this is a super, super quick overview. Wash and dry, then you airbrush a protective sealer on there, then you get into super detailing. Then we do a contrast wash. We're gonna talk a lot about contrast wash. Then we're gonna do fade or relief. Okay, we'll talk about that. Then we do graffiti, rust details, then we might do some more contrast wash. Um, don't forget at this point in time is a great time to do couplers. Uh, 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 trucks and wheels. Uh, and when you're finished with everything, don't do a finished sealer on your trucks or your wheels, okay? When you're finished with the main body of the subject, the final coat of matte acrylic sealer, and then you can, you can touch that thing with your fingers all day long, and it won't harm the effects that you've carefully crafted. Um, so um, you're going to hear me talk about matte acrylic Sealer, uh, I'm just going to say mass, okay, MAS, because uh, we're going to say that term quite often, or contrast wash. I'm just going to call it a con wash. Um, so, whether you're in, okay, if you're in N scale, this, this rule of thumb applies more to N scale than it does anything else. But sometimes we have to indicate the look we're after instead of trying to do it verbatim. I, I have HO scale envy, I have to admit. Um, how many guys are HO here? We've got one, two, three, four. I envy you guys. You have bigger subjects, bigger canvas, more detail, uh, and, and, and it's more forgiving, okay? If you have a rust week that gets a little bit out of control, it's a little longer, it's a little wider, it's still going to look good. If that happens on N scale, I, it doesn't look right. So good for you guys in HO. Uh, going above that, O, O, N30, uh, garden scale, O, N30, very nice, very nice. Um, I, I, I secretly want to get there and do some weathering subjects just to do that in that scale and get super granular with it. So, um, okay, a uh, quick airbrush overview. Um, uh, show of hands, how many folks use an airbrush? One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, of those who are using a double, okay, okay. Uh, who are doing a double action? Wow, you're all single action. Okay. All right. There's there's a double the double action. I think freaks a lot of people out because uh, of the maintenance to to and that, that's what turns a lot of people off to airbrushing in the first place, right? Maintenance. Yeah, you have to clean it after each color. That's just that's that's part of the course. That that's necessary. Um, if you want to get a little sloppy with the maintenance, 
get a couple of different cheap brushes and you keep one for this and you keep one for that and you don't cross. In other words, you keep one for solvent based paints, you keep one for or water based or acrylic based paints. And that kind of helps reduce the amount of cleanup time. Uh, with a single action, you, hit, you guys know this, all right? you, you hit the air and that's it, everything comes out. It's very difficult unless you work the nozzle uh, or you work the air pressure, it's, it's difficult to do anything other than just hit it and out, out it comes. With a dual action, at the very least, when you push down, you get air. As you pull back that lever, you can control the flow of pigment or you can control the flow of mass or you can control the flow of whatever it is you're spraying. And that ultimate control is, is why I'm absolutely espouse dual action over single action. It's all about control. You, you can you can just without having to do anything else, but just work the brush. You can control the the flow. You can control how little bit of air you want to get, how much paint you want to get. You can get right up on the subject and do some really incredible intricate work. And it matters. Let's see here. Let's grab a subject. Okay. Caveat here, I did not weather these. I, I bought these from Ryan. He was at the at the uh, at the show in Evanston. He was clearing out and updating his his scale, his uh geez, Mike. He was updating his locomotive fleet. This is his scale trains. And it's a dash nine. So if you want to get into the into the walkway here, you could do that. You probably have to get the railing out of the way and you might mask off or have the shell off, but you can get in there with a, with a dual action brush, and just lower the pressure and, and get right on there. Conversely, you can, if you wanna get some road grime underneath the, the tank here, you can get really, really close. Do a quick, I, I would throw some tape here. I would throw some tape here to keep the paint away from the trucks and the working, you know, but I would, I would leave the rest open and I would just take the pressure way down and I'd get in there and just sneak that just right across. Get your hand where you can, this is on the workbench or more importantly, work with a cradle. This is a foam cradle. You guys, you guys have anything like this? Three models? Yeah, most guys do. Okay, great, great, great. All right. Lay it in there and, and, and guide your hand across. However, you're gonna do this. I would probably put that up. And just with my pinky on here, just in the technique, just so I'm guiding, don't freehand it. Get your hand down here, guide it and go across. That's, I don't know if you can see my, my finger here, guiding across. My finger is a, is, is, is a guide. I, I don't know if you guys, if, if we're getting too simple here in elementary, but okay. So um, when it comes to airbrush, let's, let's, let's get back to a couple of the basics of airbrush. Ambient, Temperature and humidity in the room is going to affect your work. Uh, we were we were working our clinic in Southern California, uh, in, in Bob's garage, and it was about uh, 98, 99 degrees out in the middle of summer, and it was ridiculously hot. And we ended up just sort of having a coffee clutch that morning because we couldn't get any work done. Airbrush uh, paint would would flash dry too quickly. You know, um, conversely, if it's super super uh, uh, muggy outside, it's you, you've got 70, 80, 90% humidity, um, it, it's going to affect what you're doing. So uh, grab a test subject. Don't test on your actual model. I uh, can't emphasize that enough, but uh, adjust your mixture, adjust your flow, adjust your pressure to the atmospheric effects that you're working within in your garage or your basement, wherever. Uh, if you're in your basement, you've got humidity controls. That's awesome. Uh, most of us, I think, work in our garages so you know we're subject um another thing too is work uh get old uh, I, I don't want to presume that everybody is is married uh if, if if you're not uh go to the store and buy some cheap pantyhose or something like that but cut little squares and use those as a filter to when you prep your paint when you prep your sealer whatever it is uh use an eyedropper and put that into the cup for your airbrush, but put it through some nylons. 
uh, which will strain any little lumps. You don't want that lump going through and, and jamming up your, your spray right in the middle of your project. You got to take your paintbrush apart, your airbrush apart. So um, do that. Um, uh, just go to the store and buy some and you can cut them up if you have to. If you've got a wife, great. You know, before she throws them away, tell them you want them. Make sure you explain why. Um, so uh, what else here? Uh, clumps, spraying pressure. Uh, I think I'm going to assume that you guys know a little bit more about, about air, airbrush pressures. Uh, less is more. This is under the category of sneaking up on your subject. Uh, don't nail it with 50 PSI. <laughs> um, if you're doing track, somebody talked about track work, or if you're doing larger surfaces like structure, and you're going to kick your pressure up a little bit. You're going to open your pressure, uh, your spray pattern, keep your pressure high, smooth. I, 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 pardon me if I'm going over basics that everybody knows, but if, if this iPhone is the subject, you want to start off of it, smooth pass across it, stop. Again, on, do the pass, go past it, and then stop. So you're going to get an even paint. Don't start it, stop it right there. You're not saving paint as much as you are goofing up that even pass. Um, we'll get the track work as well. Uh, I don't know if I have a diagram in here about airbrushing track. So I'm going to have to gesticulate with my hands when we talk about airbrushing track. Uh, lastly, uh, health, 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 uh, a little paper dust, fil dust filter uh, that you would use if you're in a wood shop is not sufficient for keeping solvent-based particles out of your lungs. Um, so make sure you get a fume-rated mask. Your, your health is worth it, uh, enough said on there. Um, okay, uh, let me get a, a quick pulse here. How am I doing with the pace of this? Are we too down into the weeds? Is this too boring? We, are we okay here so far? Okay, all right. You're doing great, Mike. Okay, we're, we're thumbs up, okay. So let's talk about the matte acrylic sealer. The reason why, uh, well, we were taught to use an acrylic sealer as opposed to something else. If it's Krylon and it's that clear Krylon out of a can, like I said earlier, you don't know what that Krylon is formulated as. You don't know if it's acrylic based, if it's solvent, I'm pretty sure it's a solvent based chemical. What's the solvent? Is it a lacquer thinner? Is it a paint thinner? We don't know. So. Uh, as convenient as it is to use something out of a can to do this first process to seal it, I implore you, don't do that. Um, it's a paradigm shift here. Get an acrylic, either this Model Master or Vallejo, seal it with that. Okay, so when you're going to prep this thing, you want, a, you want a solution that's about skim milk, not fat-free milk and not whole milk. Believe it or not, there's a little bit of a viscosity difference. Uh, you, you want about 60% uh, flat acrylic and about 40% thinner, okay? Give or take, depending on your terrestrial effect or your ter terrestrial conditions. Okay, so uh, I recommend, and it's in my notes, the green label, I think an older bottle of the uh, testers, Aztec Universal Acrylic Thinner, might have been a blue label, but you want number 50496. It's a four ounce bottle. Uh, you, you can, in a pinch, use the isopropyl alcohol, but alcohol evaporates very, very quickly. And if you are in very warm conditions or hot conditions, that IPA is going to flash off really, really quickly. Don't even try 90% too strong. Um, okay, so again, test on a scrap model. Go get a piece of junk at, you know, go to a show and there's the guy selling uh, mini tricks from, you know, 30 years ago, go grab a couple of those for, you know, four or five, six bucks a piece. They're great test subjects. Test your solution on one of these models or get a piece of scrap plastic or whatever, you know, cardboard, whatever you have. Cardboard soaks up the paint, so that's probably not a really good idea, but if that's all you have, at least test it on that. Test your flow, test your, your, your coverage rate, okay? Um, with approximately 25 PSI, uh, and you're going to hit that model on pass the model off on, go vertically, give it a, don't get too close, don't oversaturate it, you're gonna create a run. You don't wanna do that. 
sneak up on it. You might need two passes. Hit it, turn it over, hit it, you know, however you're holding it. There's all sorts of methods. You guys have seen all the tricks. You put little pins in to the truck bolsters, or you take the whole bottom out. You, you've got your fingers in there. Here's one for you. So this is a, an SD40 Cotto, and th this is a little hobby paint stick. You get it for like 25 cents. You can buy a bag of them for two bucks. Uh, and it, it, it fits perfectly in there. You just wedge it in there and lo and behold, there you go. So a quick little stick to hold it with. And uh, off we go to the races. And I'll talk more about this project here shortly. So you're holding your subject and, and, and go ahead and, and, and spray it, you know, give it, give it the juice and then let it set. Let it set for a couple of hours, then come back and then hit it again. Let that sit overnight, 24 hours at least. Um, let's see here. If, if you want to, when you're doing matte acrylic sealer, that's a great time to be a little thrifty. Prep a whole bunch of models, get a big batch of mass and, and go nuts. Because that's a process where doing it all in one shot. You're making the most out of the time for your for your airbrush cleaning time. You're making the most out of the batch of mass that you've prepared, and you've got that rhythm going, and you're just knocking them down, subject after subject. That's when I like the batch process, is when I'm doing matte acrylic sealer. Uh, <clears throat> moving on here. So you've got your model. It's cleared. It's dried. It's, it's rested for at least uh, 24 hours, and now we're going to have some fun. Um, contrast wash, con wash. So this is, if all you did, you've got, you've got 40 coal hoppers, 80, whatever. You've got a, uh, a Pacific West Coast uh, uh, fruit train transition era, wood box, wooden box, uh, wood side box cars, reefers. Um, and and you, you got a whole string of these things. Um, now is, if at the very least all you wanted to do was, was take them out of the toy range by applying the matte acrylic right away, you've taken the plastic sheen off the model. Now it's matte. So at the very least, you've done that. So but let's get some color in there. Let's let's get a little a little bit of grime. Uh, contrast wash is a super super easy, quick way to do that. And if that's all you did on your models, on your rolling stock, and on your locomotives, you're better than fifty percent of the modelers out there. Your models are going to stand out. Not that it's a contest, maybe it is. Your models are going to stand out above the rest of the car, cars and, and locomotives uh, in, in, at the show and on, in the layout or whatever. If it's for your own home use, just kick it up a notch, man. This is the very least you can do. So we're going to prepare a contrast wash. What do we do? A contrast wash is exactly as the name applies. It's going to enhance contrast. Uh, this subject is just a test. It's a cheap little car. And I do a lot of testing on this. Um, so we've got these ribs on uh, these vertical ribs uh, and they stand out from the main panel of the side. Okay. When we add a contrast on here, we're going to enhance the transition where this vertical rib meets the side panel. Okay. We do that. We take a color. So this is a kind of a dark, warm gray. Okay. It's kind of a Kind of a grayish color, and it's 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 a little got a little warmth to it. It's it's not quite uh, too too close. It, it's so what I'm going to do to to prepare a contrast wash for this is I'm going to try and get a paint that's very close to the base color. All right, I might take a dark gray, and I'm going to add black to it. Okay, uh, a little bit of testers. All right, I use testers. It's cheap. It's effective. Uh, I'll take some testers thinner, okay, not cleaner, thinner, uh, and I will take a couple of drops of the black. I'll take uh, uh, a couple, well, more than a couple of drops. I'll get a little dish, and I'll put this base color in the dish, and I'm going to take a couple of drops of black. A little goes a long way, and I'm going to add it to, uh, with a paint drop, uh, with an eyedropper, I'm going to add a couple of drops to that warm color here and i'm going to mix it up a little bit and i'm going to get some thinner 
and I'm going to put the thinner in there, and I'm going to go for a solution that's as uh, it, it looks and feels as it drips off the, 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 the paintbrush. It's going to look like skim milk, okay, like 2% uh, milk, all right? Not whole milk, not, not fat-free milk. Uh, and, and so we have this solution, and it's a darker color than the base color of the model. And I'm going to take that, and I should have prepared. So here we go, Mike. Um, all right. Now, where is... Okay. So this is a round paint brush. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we'll do this with that. This is a round brush, small round brush. You can get a larger brush than this one. This is a kind of a detailed brush. Depending on the subject, if I were using, uh, if I were doing a contrast wash on the side of a building, I would, I would get a brush that, would, that was this size as opposed to that size, okay? The larger one is a number six, the small one is a number three. Okay, so somewhere right three or four, maybe five. You would take your model and you just put some paint in there and you just move along and move along and move along. And what happens is you, you get the paint in there and you hit it and the paint's gonna just run down in that little seam, a little meniscus of, of paint is going to just drip right down along that line. And at the bottom, you can just wipe it off a little bit, dab your paintbrush, go in there and just let that sit, okay? Once you've done that and you let that dry for several hours, you're going to take the thinner very, very gently, get something like this applicator, and you're just going to get the applicator damp and you're just going to wipe down, wipe, wipe, wipe down, straight down. What happens is this sponge won't get all the way into that little corner. It'll leave a little little meniscus up of paint of, of tinted paint up against that vertical rib, and that punches out the highlights where those those surfaces meet. It punches up the contrast of that juncture of the vertical rib and the main horizontal surface. There's a little little bit of paint in there, and that little bit of paint enhances the contrast of that surface detail. That's why we call it a contrast wash. So that's the mechanics of what, how a contrast wash works. There, if all you did was matte acrylic seal your model and did the contrast wash, cleaned off the contrast wash and then sealed it up again, you're, you're, you're right down the goalposts. Uh, you're, you're a huge step forward uh, ahead of, of what most people are willing to do. That doesn't take long to do that. And that's the general approach that I would take with, uh, with uh, unit trains, coal drags, fruit express, uh, tankers. Um, I'm trying to think of other, you've got so many that are similar. At the very least, if they all had a contrast wash, then you could just grab like 10% of the rolling stock and go into detail on that 10%, 15%, kind of get that bell curve that we talked about earlier. So uh, there's details uh, on the contrast wash process. I'm not gonna belabor this too much. Um, on the handout, it talks about the, the applicators. It talks about uh, removal things, uh, cotton swabs. Um, let's see here. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Everything is right here on the desk. How about that? So here's the blue label. That's what you want to look for. The details of this are in the handout. Okay. That's the blue label. Uh, stock up on a lot of that. 70% isopropyl alcohol. Uh, I use it for cleaning my, my uh, dual action airbrush as much as I do anything else. Clean acrylic paint with, with isopropyl alcohol. Don't use solvent to do that. These applicators, these come from Rite Aid. Okay, I think I've got pictures of this in the handout. Um, these little guys are amazing. If this works for N scale, imagine what you can do in, in, in uh, HO. So using the paddle side, 
You can, you, you can remove or relieve with this paddle side and you'll, you'll get pigment on there. You can, you can use this little wedge part to get in a little bit tighter. If it's a total goof and you want to strip it out, these little guys are fantastic. Uh, when it comes to being penny wise and pound foolish, just remember that these are pennies. Throw them away when they get dirty. Stop reusing them. Uh, to a certain point, they're useless. You, you, you've saturated them with paint, whatever. Uh, okay, so that's contrast wash. Um, and I go into some really, really good detail in the handout about how to prepare the paint for contrast wash. The contrast wash, gentlemen, will work on rooftops. It will work on building sidings. It will work on locomotives. Uh, it'll work on rolling stock, of course. Um, I've never used it on track. Um, um, I, I guess it could. Uh, it would certainly work very well on trestles, on, on track side details. Uh, gosh, anything where you've got surface details. You've got little rivets. You've got hand grabs. You've got uh, uh, panels that come together. There are seams there. And you, you want a little bit of pop with that. To me, it makes a product, um, yeah, here I am, I'm gonna forget the name of it. I've never used it. I was introduced to it at the Evanston show. Um, they have a name for it, it's like panel, oh, something or other. It's, it's, a, it's a thin, thin black paint. What it is ostensibly is they've taken, they've taken a black color, a black pigment paint, and they've added a lot of thinner to it. So it's very, very, very thin. And it does work really, really well in doing grills like back here, okay? Um, the, the only thing I don't like about the Tamiya product is they give you, you get one color. That's actually, maybe, maybe, Tamiya, maybe I'm wrong here, but maybe Tamiya has a variety of colors, in which case, great. Just get the color that's closest to what you need. But on, on these BNSF-9s, if you've ever seen them really up close, that's uh, a really thin orange paint screen. And it shows a lot of the engine bay in there where the, uh, uh, the radiator is, and there's a compressor back there. Uh, uh, there's a couple of things back there and you can see right through that grating, but it's so thin, it looks, it comes off as being dark, but it's not black, at least not in this paint scheme. But anyway, the Tamiya stuff is, is pretty good. Uh, uh, Alexis was at the show. Uh, I, I think you, you, you all heard about the, the show that we all went to there. Uh, she had an Amtrak train that was uh, brilliantly uh, weathered uh, in that it was really, really super clean. But all those little details, all those little vents and screens and panels <clears throat> on the uh, Amtrak, Alexis went in there and she used that that uh, to me, uh, to great effect, I, I, I was absolutely sold. If you have a silver car, a, a silver coach, it's it's a passenger or something like that, and you've got these really super, super fine details, uh, screens, uh, 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 mesh panels that are, are concealing compressors or air conditioning units or, or uh, the heat resistant brake racks or something like that, that to me is stuff is fantastic. Um, be careful. If you get a really cool hammer, don't make everything a nail. Just don't go hog wild with that thing and put it everywhere. Uh, oh, door seams. Oh, look, uh, hatch panels. Don't put it everywhere because all of a sudden it takes on this effect and uh, it, it doesn't look real. It looks like something, okay? It might not look bad, but it doesn't look real. And that's where I implore you once again, go back to a photo, a color photo of your subject. Um, okay, quick feedback here. Wake up, guys. Anybody got a question? Anybody got uh, uh, an anecdote of, of any of these techniques that I've talked about or any situations where you've come across something similar to this? Mike, I have a question about sealer. Um, what's your feeling about dull coat as a sealer before you start putting leather on? Dull coat. Great question. Uh, great product uh, used extensively throughout our community. I don't like it. Again, for the following reasons. I can't control the flow rate. I can't control the distribution pattern. And I don't know what dull coat is made of. Even though it's a tester's product and I might, might be working with tester's paints. Um, uh, I, I, I personally, I avoid it. 
I, you, I can buy, you can buy it and uh, dilute it and spray it through an airbrush too. Well, that I would go for. That I would go for. Um, I can control everything about this. I can control the viscosity and I can control the, the, the how, 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 well, the viscosity, how thick it is, how thin it is. Uh, I can control the, the, how much coat I put on. Um, I know it's, it's an acrylic. So once it dries, it will be inert. It, 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 that's it, it's done. It's a shrink wrap layer. I don't know about dull coat. I think dull coat is in the solvent based area. Um, and I honestly don't know enough about dull coat other than I've seen some disastrous results where somebody sealed with dull coat that they went in to try and do a solvent based contrast wash and the solvent on that contrast wash I'll talk I have to double back on the solvent in a year in a second the solvent based contrast wash activated the dull coat and it was a gooey mess to clean up it was a gooey mess and so ah, we, we, we learned back then, just say no to dull coat, um, whether it came out of a can or whether it was airbrushed, but I think if it's airbrushed, please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on this one. What solvent is used to fit it out to get it to go through your airbrush? Uh, I'm not asking rhetorically. Is, is it a solid, is it a tester's thinner or uh, that you would use, Roger? Have you, have you used it and thin it out? Yeah, I've used lacquer thinner without any real problem. Um, and, you know, furthermore, um, I've used a, um, I'm not trying to argue with you, Mike, but I mean, I've, I've used dull coat as, as a sealer and then used uh, dilutions of oils in turpentine and applied that without any real problem. So, you know, I guess we all have different methods. I'm just trying and I'm not, not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, Absolutely. hey, there's some other options too. Absolutely, and, and those are great options. Uh, I've seen phenomenal work done with oils, uh, and I've seen some great results with dull, dull coat. Okay, so uh, personally speaking, my own experience, I don't go near it. Um, but like you said, and, and no argument. I mean, there are there are. There's a euphemism we used to use. Apologies to cat people here, but there's there's a hundred ways to skin a cat, right? Uh, <laughs> there, some people swear by oils. Some people like water-based oils. I still can't get my head around that oil-based stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've got a, 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 my degree. I've got a bachelor's of science from Arts Center, College of Design. I'm not, I'm not trying to name drop here or anything like that again. But I work with oil paints. I work with uh, watercolors. I work with gouache. I sprayed automotive lacquers. I've worked with them all. Uh, I've, I've worked. I did work with tempera. Tempera. I, I never got into that egg yolk thing with tempera. I mean, weird, weird science, a little too artsy for me. Um, but my point is, there's a lot of materials out there. There's a lot of methods to put pigment down on a subject. And, and by all means, Roger, if you've had success with dull coat and you've had success with oils, awesome. Keep going, especially if it works for you and you're getting the results you want. Um, the contrast, the con wash method here, uh, is a, this is a great insertion point. The reason why we're using a solvent based, whether it's turpentine or whether it's lacquer, uh, put a pin on the lacquer, I'm gonna come back to that one, or whether it's thinner based, okay, there's difference, right? Lacquer is different than, uh, than a turpentine is different than a, a, a paint thinner, okay? Lacquer is really, really aggressive. Floquil used to use a lacquer based, I think they, well, they don't make Floquil anymore, right? So I could say used to. Um, I had, uh, really failed you guys here by not having uh, a bunch of subjects on hand ready to pull out and show you. I was doing a Burlington Northern Santa Fe Heritage 2 scheme, um, uh, orange and the green, and uh, I, was, I was doing contrast wash and I was using Floquil paints. And even though I had a mass, a matte acrylic sealer on this thing, I started doing the relief method on the contrast wash. In other words, I've taken uh, taken the orange, the, the BNSF orange, I, I, I tinted it down with, with a dark brown, by the way, um, and, and I put it on there and, and everything was looking good and it's time to relieve, to take most of that away, leave just a little paint in the nooks and crannies. And I started taking the BNSF logo right off the side of the locomotive, I freaked. And it was because the lacquer thinner was so aggressive and went right through the matte, the, uh, matte acrylic. Two, two, two things wrong there. 
I was using the wrong solvent to relieve with. It was too aggressive. And I don't think my mass acrylic sealer was thick enough. Okay. Wasn't thick enough. Maybe it was too warm that day when I sprayed it. Maybe the, the, the uh, base solution was too thin. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, go with what works. Go with one more question. Works. One more question, Mike, is, is a pledge has also been suggested as a sealer. It's an acrylic. Have you used it? Which one? Pledge, the floor. Um... Pledge. I have mm -hmm. used pledge, but not as a, an overall sealer. I used it to reduce silvering on decaling. That was a technique that I picked up from a couple of different people online, uh, looking and researching, and, and people swore by pledge. Um, I ended up, damn it. I think I've got the photos in the, uh, all right, hold on. I'm going to see here. I'm going to jump around. Yeah, pledge tends to be glossy, but it's a good thing to use on a flat painted model to go and put the, uh, um, you know, decal on and then put a coating over the top to dull it. Yes. I'm going to show Go ahead. Uh, let's say pledge also saves uh, old decals. You can uh, mm -hmm. put a coat on with a foam brush, let it dry, and it'll uh, it'll save the decal from coming apart. Yes, Andy, do you uh, Andy use the pledge straight, or do you dilute it with something? Uh, it with something. I haven't done it yet. It's just uh, what I read. Uh, I bought a bottle of pledge. Um, and uh, I've got some old decals start coming apart. I'm waiting to see just how well it works. But uh, decal people have told me that they've used that quite a bit to protect the decal. Yeah, I misunderstood what you're talking about. Rescuing an old decal. I got you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, here, I'm going to share a screen again. Stand by. Okay, so this is a, a uh, uh, obviously a, a caboose uh, and the decaling on here, I put a lot of pledge on there to try and reduce the, the silvering on there. Um, and uh, yeah, it turned out pretty well. It, it, it's okay, it's okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of that one. Um, there's no pledge used on there. That's a... Uh, Exact rail, one of the exact rail gondolas. Uh, I worked from a photo. That's exactly how this, the graffiti out of a white spray can looked. Uh, that's the road number. That's exact. Uh, had real fun with that one. Um, we still see the caboose. Let's go back. Is there. that what you're talking about? Oh, did it not? Did it not update? I'm sorry. Oh, there Come we on. go. There we go. Yeah. That's the caboose. Sorry about that. Um, can you see that one? Yes. Huh? Okay. Yes. Uh, the that's the gondola I was just talking about. Um, so yeah, if you can see where my mouse is, right over here, in the corner here, there was it was almost like an anti con wash that was going on, uh, and the real prototype, um, really unusual. Uh, usually, in that little corner right there, going up and down, see there's a little bit of a white feel to that. Uh, that was kind of fun to try and recreate, actually. Um, but, but, you know, there, there you go. It, it's not a rust bucket. Uh, I had somebody tell me, oh, it's, it's too weathered. It's too new of a gondola to look that beat up. I'm like, oh, yeah, go look at the photo. Um, you know, not that you want to argue about it, but, you know, and there you go. There's just a like road grime. That's all that one is. It's just a lot of road grime. Uh, these were shot outdoors in sunlight. Um, here I, I admit a little too heavy on the on the uh, the the roadbed dust, um, but here you can see where the contrast wash on these panel features is really starting. To, well, in my opinion, it's working pretty well. Uh, I've had a couple of people tell me they they really liked the way it was handled and and it wasn't overdone. Um, and uh, so there you go. Uh, and here's more of a rust bucket. Um, this, uh, yeah, uh, Exact Rail put some really, really heavy, heavy paint when they did these decals. It was, 
Uh, I was trying to do the, the, the BNSF, the, the, excuse me, the BN faded look there. Um, and I tell you, man, you learn from your mistakes, right? So I, I had it, it was looking phenomenal. And uh, I, I was gently working it with, I think, six or 800 grit sandpaper. I had to go through that heavy to get down to where. Uh, and then, so I went to, <laughs> such an idiot. Uh, I have to share the mistake because, you know, what you're looking at here is not exactly realistic. Okay. I totally admit it. Um, but I, I had worked it dry with the sandpaper, which is the first time I tried this technique, by the way. And uh, I, I, so I go in and I, I take some alcohol on a sponge to wipe it away. And uh, yeah, I didn't seal it first. And all the finesse that I had in there that looked fantastic completely went away. Totally, <laughs> totally screwed up. Didn't seal it first and, and I lost the effect. Um, some of these rust weeps, it, it, they're okay. Uh, like this one here is bad. I totally am using this as an example to show where I failed. Um, let me zoom in here a little bit, um, take it up to about 150 and we'll move this over a little bit more. Rust doesn't go over and then drop and it doesn't get wider as it goes down. Uh, which ones work? This one works. This, this one here is, is kind of sloppy. Um, I'm kind of getting my head ahead of myself here, uh, talking about rust weeps. Uh, that one's okay. This was the first car where I was using some rust weeps uh, and, and uh, a little guilty of, hey, I found a cool hammer, everything's a nail. Um, but there is a box car that looks like this. So the steps to get to this point, uh, did a mass sealer, okay, ma uh, mat acrylic sealer. Then I went in and uh, I sprayed a, a light, light ghosting coat of testers sand. Okay, I didn't use straight white. Um, when you use sand as opposed to straight white paint, um, the, the sand gives a little bit of sun warmth to it, first of all, and it's enough that it takes the general color down, right? We wanted to fade the, the grand trunk, and, and then, you know, there's all this rust going on up here. Uh, this is all done with designer's gouache. It's a watercolor, designer's gouache. I've seen great effects done with oil, um, as, as Roger pointed out. I would suggest that you don't use oil on N scale, that you use it on HO and up, okay? Um, the oil is a very, very good solution, um, a solution as in uh, problem solving, okay? It's a very good uh, effect to the approach. Um, the reason I stay away from it with N scale is it's, it's uh, a little too much like bringing a bazooka to a knife fight. Um, N scale requires a ridiculous amount of finesse. And I, not exaggerating, I spent three years trying to use different techniques to apply gouache or paint, period, to an N scale subject to get rust weeps to be this fine. And uh, this in itself is, is definitely hands on. And I, I, I'm not prepared to show that today, but it's using watercolor. Gouache is like watercolor, but it's a very thick version of watercolor. And uh, I'm probably way out of sequence here in talking about the, the, uh, the materials used. But because it's watercolor, you can take a damp brush and go straight down. And as you wipe straight down with a little bit of water, you take some of the paint away. And then you, you would make that downward stroke completely vertical down. Then you, then you wipe a little bit of the pigment off the brush and you go back in and you wipe it again. And you're mixing two or three different colors of gouache right on the model as it's wet, as the paint is damp or wet, and you're wiping most of it away and you, you get these really good thin controlled effects. Um, and this, is, this effect is completely, it completely translates to structures, chimneys, um, roofs, sides of buildings, um, you name it. it, it uh, underneath a bridge, an abutment where you've got steel that's uh, like the skid plate on a truss, uh, sitting on the horizontal friction plate. Um, you all know that bridges are pinned at one point. I only need to get bridge construction here, but uh, let, me, let me end screen sharing there. Stop share, I'll get back to here. Um, anyway, uh, it's a great, great, effective, very controllable uh, uh, rust weep technique, 
and, and it, it would definitely scale up from N. You can use it effectively. Uh, one of the guys in the weathering group that, that I used to work with, he has a lot of garden scale. And he had these logging cars that had all these little bolts on them, these, these big, huge, big bolts, actually, to the yokes that would hold these giant logs. Um, Sierra Nevada logging, you know, and, and, and so each bolt had his own little rust weep. He went crazy in there and, and, and he used the effect, uh, the, used the technique to great effect. So anyway, there you, there you go. There's, there's some of that. Let's get back on track here with my talking points. Um, any other questions real quick before we jump back into the, to the uh, contrast wash and some of those other techniques? Any, yeah, any Mike, other? What was the, the colors that you use for your rust? Because it really looks very, very realistic. Definitely better than some of the stuff I've seen that comes out of bottles, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was worked. Um, in fact, well, let's go to the handout. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back here and share again. We're gonna just pop back and forth here. Uh, well, share, 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 where'd you go? Screen share. Okay, right there. Uh, is it sharing? Did we get it? Okay. So design, Windsor Newton designer's gouache is what I use there. And uh, let me zoom in a little bit more uh, so we can get the names there. Oh, come on. Ah, whoa. We are in the editable version here. Okay. Yellow ochre is a very yellowish color and it's great for new, new rust. Old rust, you want to go with burnt umber. And this applies for oils too, by the way. These are the same colors that you would use for oil. Um, Raw umber is a medium aged rust. And for absolutely, really, really ridiculously new rust, uh, let's see if I can just zoom this in here. Uh, it's not gonna go. We'll just jump here to there. Is that gold ochre? Gold ochre, okay. Um, test it out, okay. the. The thing about gouache is it goes on opaque and you can, depending on how you, how much water you get on it and how much you wipe away, it suddenly becomes uh, translucent. And that's how you get that effect of rust weeping on a blue box car or green or red or black or anything else. It depends on how opaque it is. It depends on what colors you're using. And those colors very strategically can tell a story of super old rust and, and uh, new rust, and it depends on how active the, the wound is on the metal. Um, let, me, let me end the sharing here. I realize I'm waving hands in front of a camera that's not picking me up. It's all about the hand wave, right? Uh, so when, you, when you're doing those weeps, uh, you, know, you, you wanna make sure you're telling a story with the colors as much as you're telling a story with how wide those rust weeps are, right? How long they are. Uh, if it's a fairly new rust weep, it's not going to be dripping all the way down the side of the, of the vehicle. It's going to be closer to the top of wherever that, that friction point is that's taking paint away and causing raw metal to be exposed to the elements, right? Um, so that's the story there. And, and in fact, the, the, while we're here on the subject, uh, a very simple one, two, three method of putting the colors down. And you can be very sloppy with this, okay? You start with a, a fairly broad stroke of the darkest burnt umber. You, 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 you apply uh, a streak of the burnt umber. Then you come onto it with, uh, and you go the full length down, by the way, of, of however long you want the rust weep to be. Then you come on there with the, the, uh, uh, the I think it was the ochre, the middle value. <laughs> And then you come on with the lightest value and you do the lightest value at the very top, okay? And your, your middle value is like maybe halfway down the rust weep and the darkest value is all the way down. But you put them in that order, oldest, medium, newest rust. Now is the trick. You need to get a very good quality flat brush. This is where you don't cheap out, okay? Go get an absolutely insanely expensive eight, nine, ten dollar brush, and don't 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 go get the two dollar cheapo, okay? Because the technique completely relies upon the springiness of. Oh, let's get that 
in the sunlight just right, the springiness of that flat brush. And what you do, you get it damp enough. So you've got a little paper towel off to the side, you get some water and you, you hit and you just gently wipe it down and you relieve some of the paint off the brush and you go back in again. You, you just make one smooth stroke gently. And what you're doing is you're mixing the three colors together on the fly. And as you get towards the bottom, you're taking that paint away. And what you have, if you're perfectly vertical with your stroke, what you have is, a, is an absolutely remarkably accurate, realistic looking rust weed. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling you guys, honestly, I'm sharing with you my best trip, tip right there. I spent three years trying different, I would take copper wire, little pieces straight of copper wire, and I would try and apply it onto the side of the model to try and get the paint. And, uh, and, and, and one day uh, it came out to Vegas to visit. I was still living in Southern California. Drove out to Vegas to visit my folks here for uh, Christmas one year. And I'm sitting there at you know, midnight at the Christmas or at the, <laughs> the breakfast table. And I'm, I'm, I'm in nice and peaceful, quiet. I have time and I was experimenting on that blue box car. And, and I hit it and man, the lights went off. I'm like, there it is, there it is. Finally, Eureka, finally. After all those years of, of, of searching, uh, you can do that with oil, but the oil is a little bit more difficult to work with. And the beauty about the watercolor, by the way, the gouache, is if it's really screwed up, get a wet sponge, wipe it away, it's all gone. It comes right off the model. You can start over again. And if you, uh, if you remember the picture I showed you, it's in the back of the handout, uh, those pictures that we were just looking at, uh, that's a little $2 plate from Ikea, little cheap white plate to use as, the, as my palette. Um, when, that oil, when those watercolors dry on that plate, I can come in the next day and get them wet and reactivate them. So it's a very frugal painting method. Um, and, and it, it, it's, it's really, really reliable. The paints themselves, I, it's going to be a little pricey. Those are like $15, $18 a bottle for the, or a tube. So the paint is pricey. It'll last forever, and it's beautiful color. And, you know, once you've got that rust weep on there, you've got to seal it. You've got to seal it. You don't want, when you're putting your models on and off the track, you don't want your fingerprints getting in there and, and damaging those rust weeps, especially if you go through the trouble of, of literally artistically applying them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of finesse, but in my opinion, the results are absolutely worth it. Okay, any other questions at this point? Mike, uh, just a, a quick one. I went to a weathering class years ago and it was all on gouache and uh, I was amazed with it, but they used Windex. They said, use Windex, not a cheap name brand. It might've been because what Windex has in it, but they use that for thinning. And uh, I, I was really impressed with it. What, what do you seal with yours with after it's done? Um. I seal everything with with testers matte acrylic when when it's done. Um, okay. I've never heard of using uh, Windex as a thinner for the paint. Uh, I, I've never tried to work with it. Uh, all I can imagine is uh, the reason why that may be effective is that the uh, the Windex is acting like thin water. Like when we add uh, when we do ballast weathering or uh, gluing down. Uh, shrubs and, and grass and dirt to our track, right? You, you, we use thin water. We add a couple of drops of, of alcohol to it, right? And it breaks the surface tension of the water, maybe breaking the surface tension of the water and making it really, really thin with Windex. Uh, maybe that puts the gouache down smoother or the watercolor more smoothly onto the surface. I don't know. I've never tried it. Um, I, I mean, well, a little concern with the coloring of the Windex being a little mm -hmm. blue. Now you're shifting. No, colors. it doesn't affect it any. Say that again. It it does not affect it any. And we were using Windsor uh, Newton also uh, for for that. Fantastic. I, I I've never tried it. I've never tried it again. If the end results work, stick with it. You know, that, that's the beauty yeah. about an environment like this, where we have different modelers, different experience, and people are, are, are sharing. Um, 
you know, when I, when I bash on dull coat, uh, all, all respects to Roger and anyone else who uses it, I forget that there's a version that you can control through an airbrush. So, um, you know, revisit that and, and you know, I, I, I may look at it. But my thought is, personally, my thought is if I have to go mix it and prep it, put it through an airbrush, I'm just going to go back to this because I'm doing the same thing with this. And this is an acrylic. And on that real quick, the reason I like the acrylic, and this is what I was taught by, by my master, Robert Tico, is there's a process in building up and layering the weathering. It's all about layering. And so with the, mat, the, the matte acrylic, keyword is acrylic, think of it this way. You, 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 have your, your, you have your plastic subject. I'm gonna put a barrier of plastic. Now I can come on top of that plastic with solvent. The solvent's not gonna go through the plastic unless it's flow quill lacquer based. Okay, so you, you got plastic solvent, then you can seal it with more plastic and come onto it with more solvent. Maybe somewhere in those layers, you've got a decal, protect the decal with the plastic, come back on with a solvent contrast wash, whatever. So it's this layering and you're putting plastic against the solvent. You're not putting the solvent on top of the solvent because the solvent, when it's dry, can get reactivated by the solvent in whatever you're doing, right? That's the key. You wanna separate the layers of the solvent-based pigment so that it's not affected by subsequent layers of solvent, okay? If you can accomplish that with dull coat and it works, fantastic. Um, and, and oil paints, same thing, all right? If you've got oil and you've, you've crafted all these rust details with oils, this is kind of another reason why I've sort of avoided it. You gotta really seal that really, really well. And as far as I know, at least from my experience going to an art school for my degree, Oils take a long time to dry. And it's enough that I'm already investing eight, nine, 10 hours into this weathering subject. Now I gotta really wait for that thing to make sure it's dry, right? And I don't wanna mess up what I just did. And if it's still somewhat malleable, if that oil paint is still somewhat uh, subject to being moved around, that pigment can be moved around. Ooh, I don't wanna seal it yet. You don't wanna seal it until that stuff is done chemically reacting and doing what it's supposed to do. When that pigment is done and dry, then you seal it. But that's another subject to get into, right? You have to wait for solvent stuff to dry. At least with the contrast wash, it's a really thin wash. It's a, it's a staining, really. It's like you're staining the subject with this thin, thin coat. It's going to flash off and dry. I always recommend you wait 24 hours between sealing it, whatever you're doing, but with oils, I just don't know about that dry time. I have no experience with it on model railroading. So that's my experience. Your mileage may differ if you've used it. And I'd love to hear from you. And right now is a great point in the insertion. Has anybody done extensive weathering with oils? And what are your dry times? What have you done to seal that oil? OK. Um, not, not that I'm trying to prove anybody wrong. I really want to learn as well. Um, I've seen some phenomenal work. There are guys on, on some of these weathering uh, uh, online, if you've seen some of these weathering groups, uh, they used to be called the weathering shop and then they changed their name and they're really, really brutal with their critiques, but they, they're absolutely all about the fidelity of the work done. I think they work a lot in O scale. So take that as a grain of salt, right? Here I am trying to do these incredible techniques and end these guys are doing this stuff in O, oh, but they'll spend dozens of hours on these subjects and they look phenomenal. I, I'm, we're gonna look at some of them as an example here shortly. So we've talked about contrast wash. We've talked about preparing it. Um, um, enamel paints are what I use to do 90% of my work. I do have flow quill. Um, I've never found a color out of a jar that I can't replicate. Uh, granted, I, I, I studied color theory for two semesters, so I can mix my paints to get the colors I want. I know that not everybody has that experience in their drawer, so you're going to buy the paint that says it's uh, Burlington Northern Cascade Green, or you're going to buy the Union Pacific Armor Yellow right off the shelf, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's completely legit. You're getting an accurate color, and, and that's good, and that's very important, and I respect that. Um, uh, we've talked about sealing the final, uh, the finished artwork. 
Um, uh, if you've not looked through the handout here, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping down here through a couple of things because I'm trying to be mindful of the fact that we've been online now for what? Are we we had it, we had it almost an hour. Were we coming mm -hmm. up on? We're coming up on two hours. Hour, hour and a half. Hour and a half. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk about some other uh, other things that we we apply. Um, aim weathering powder. There, a lot of people talk about pan pastels. Again, I've never used them. Um, people swear by them. Um, I'm, I'm I'm I go to aim weathering chalks. Um, do not use AIM weathering chalk to weather your track, period, okay? AIM puts some kind of a fine metallic powder in their chalks. It's part of what helps them lay down so smoothly. Problem with that is if you use it to weather your track, your locomotives are going to come by, and I've heard that the magnetics in the engines can pull up some of that chalk, and you're going to gum up your locomotive and your gears. Very bad. Very bad day at the office if that happens. So, um, there's your caveat. But as far as structures go, as far as locomotives go, as far as rolling stock goes, I love them. I swear by them. Two things. You can put them down dry. You can, you can apply them with regular art brushes. Um, I have gone to, um, again, this is in the handout. Uh, do I have an example? Do I have an example? Uh, I do not have one ready to go, but I have a picture of it in the handout. Um, this is a cheap little $8, I think it was like eight bucks at, at Target. Uh, it's just a really nice fine. Before I ever spray anything, I literally, uh, I'm just dusting off lint, dusting off loose, whatever, okay? Um, very good for that sort of thing, especially if you're doing an initial matte acrylic on the model. If you've got chalk work on there, you probably don't want to do that. Um, but they have a little cosmetic applicator. Um, and I got them at Target, and they were really, really cheap. Um, but it's great for applying chalks. And you want to brush those chalks on. You can also activate that chalk with regular 70% isopropyl alcohol. And you can do some really, really cool things with getting the alcohol and into the paints. Does anybody have any open gondolas or vehicles that... Uh, rolling stock that gets a lot of beat up rust on the inside. Anybody have anything like that? Okay. This is the inside. And yeah, pardon that giant hole there. That's just a cheap little model. And I don't know if that is very visible. Let's see if I can find uh, one of the subjects here in the slideshow. Um, let's see here. There we go. That'll work. All right, I'm gonna share a screen here again. Screen sharing, let's go to that one. Okay, so here on the inside, we've got these, these vertical streaks on the inside wall and we've got all this rust in here. Um, it's debatable as to whether a gondola that new would have that much rust in it, but notice the color of the rust. It's all very new. That could be powder, residue left behind from that which was contained inside the gondola. It could also be the sidewalls and the bottom floor of the gondola that's beat up and rusting uh, quite newly. That is done with two or three colors of AIM. I literally just load one of those cosmetic brushes up and I just tap the brush as I move it across the subject and little, you know, it's like snowflakes of different colors of chalk uh, they go down there, and then I take an eyedropper of isopropyl alcohol, and I just drop it in there, and I let the isopropyl alcohol weep out into the rust pattern. Um, Bob probably remembers the demo from, uh, this is super, super quick and easy. The isopropyl alcohol dries in a matter of minutes. You can spray and seal it, and you're done. You could also go in while it's either wet or dry. And, and scrape in these little vertical striations you see in here because load goes in and out vertically. It's gonna come out and scrape the wall vertically. Um, and that's how you're gonna get some of those effects. And you can do that. You can add this effect in here, the vertical striping. Once it's dry, you could also do it while it's wet. It doesn't matter. Um, and again, because it's the chalk, it comes out as easily as gouache paint does. You don't like it, get something, get a big sponge, wet it with isopropyl alcohol and wipe it all away. Uh, don't forget to 
uh, beat up the edges. Take a graphite pencil. Some people use a silver Prismacolor pencil. I like the graphite better. It just looks more like uh, burnished, polished metal. Um, hit the edge with the side of your pencil lead and just drag it back and forth. Notice I did that over here on the grabs for boot scrapes. Um, it's a great little effect to use uh, on anywhere where you're going to have wear, where the paint is often worn away by something else. Something's wearing the, the surface paint away, but it, it's so much wear and tear that rust never settles there because it's constantly being burnished and polished, like boot scrapes and like the edges of gondolas. Neat little super fast technique to add some pop and some uh, intensity to your weathering. Um, what else we got here? Uh, okay, you know what, let's do this. Um, let's look at some examples here and I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about some things that really, really work. Not all of this work is mine. Uh, I will point out where it's mine. If it's not, just assume that I downloaded these images online. Um, and uh, so here is an HO scale uh, gondola and the rust work on here, the color is absolutely flawless. Uh, especially where that rust comes over the white. You can really see the age of that rust wheat. Um, I really love what's happening down here. Can you see more of my mouse is moving? Can you guys see that? Is that good? Okay, yeah, all right, good. So that's, uh, here's another view of this gondola, just showing some really, really nice work here. Uh, notice the side rails here, what's happening on top of those surfaces. The trucks are done. We're really zoomed in here on this photo. Um, and this is where I would say, and I'm going to point out that this may have been a dull coat sealer. I don't know, but the texture, yeah, um, the color is interesting. It, it, it's a faded, faded uh, uh, black or dark, dark, and it, it, it will fade to gray. Uh, all right, here's a uh, the, the the roof here is done exquisitely, and, and I would guarantee you that this roof was done not from imaginary. Uh, intuitive, oh, this is what a roof is going to do. I've tried it, it doesn't work. Yeah, but this roof was done working from a picture. I, I'll bet you anything. Uh, it just looks very, very real. The rust pattern is believable. It shows a significant amount of age and it's done consistently throughout. Um, here are some uh, brilliant different ways of beating up uh, the, the paint and it's dark and it's old rust. Okay, it's old rust and all these little little licks and scratches. They're not weeping, which is not unusual. It happens. Um, and and it, it's a great way of talking. There's some weeping going on down here, not much. Uh, down at the bottom of the sill and over here on the side of the door. Uh, that could also be, uh, I, I would say that's a rust weep because the way it's going in and out of this undulating uh, corrugate side here, that waffling. Uh, the only way you're going to get that is if, rust is running and dripping down in there. Um, there's a little bit of rust we weeping going on here as well. It tells a great believable story. Um, here's, uh, here's another, uh, another fantastic piece. Uh, so this is not mine. Uh, some really nicely handled rust weeps in here. I believe this is HO here. Uh, these are just absolutely fantastic. Uh, they really, really tell a great story of age and they look completely believable. Uh, it looks absolutely like it was done from a photo. Uh, here we go. This is not so good. Um, first of all, why is the truck so pasty white? Uh, I don't know. Um, because I think the whole car was done. Literally, some guys do this. They roll the car past a can of whatever they're spraying. And the car goes left to right in front of whatever the spray is, their airbrush, a can. Uh, and it nails everything with the same color of what? I don't know, um, but it doesn't look believable. It looks like it's trying to be middle-aged on the tracks. It's you know a little bit of dark, a little bit of warmth here. Is that road grime? I don't know. There's a little bit of road grime over here. Why isn't the same amount of road grime on the truck? I don't know. So it's it's inconsistent in its story. It, it, it it's not believable in my opinion. Um, this is an example of homemade graffiti. Just say no. Uh, I've yet to see anybody do homemade graffiti that works in any scale, by the way. A little bit of water there. Um, it just doesn't work. 
Um, that's not the way real graffiti happens anyway. Um, here's another disaster that didn't work. Um, this person tried to take, I don't know, um, some kind of a rust or mud color and uh, they gave the whole thing. I've seen people eBay this stuff and they have the audacity to call it professionally weathered. Um, I would say professionally ruined. And I know I'm being harsh. I don't mean to be a jackass about it, but um, really step back from what you do every now and then and have a look and, and compare it to a photo. If you don't have the exact photo of what you're modeling, at least look at a blue box car that has some rust on it and ask yourself, have I accomplished that? Um, this is just incomplete. It's there's just the story on the roof is inconsistent. The side panels are inconsistent. Um, what is this? I mean, I, I don't know. Okay, moving on. Um, I did not do these. Um, this is sad. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look real. Uh, it doesn't look real. Amtrak keeps their locomotives pretty clean. Um, uh, but there's inconsistent grime going on in these grills up here. This is a perfect use of that Tamiya panel uh, contrast, panel highlighting paint that Tamiya makes. Um, completely a perfect use for it. Uh, but this stuff down here, like th these vertical stripes, first of all, they're, they're inconsistent. Look underneath the K in Amtrak, it, like, it wipes backwards. Why? That doesn't make sense. If anything, it would be purely vertical. Uh, what is this color going on here? Um, wh what is that? I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I've done, I've done, and I've, I've done this very locomotive for somebody, and I think I've got a picture of it. I'll show here in the next frame. Uh, let's look at the roof. Why is there grime way up over here uh, ab above the cab? I don't know. What story are we telling? I, I don't know what's being told there. Um, this is. Uh, one that I did for uh, Harold uh, at Inland Pacific. So the grates are a little bit more consistent. Yeah, there's some, some grime on the roof. Uh, I used to rail fan at Fullerton Depot and I used to stand on top of the pedestrian bridge and I've got hours of video and hundreds of photos. Uh, and this is what they look like on the roof. Uh, there's a little bit of soot coming out of this, this exhaust. Uh, and so it's kind of sooty and it's not really a weird clear pattern either. It's, it's kind of strange. Um, but there's a little bit of road grime on there, but not much. Um, what we were going for was, uh, the, uh, the Southwest chief, uh, as it rolls in from coming off the, uh, uh, the transcon, um, uh, here's some stuff that's not quite working. Uh, if there is this much heavy rust up here and it's new rust, um, I don't know why it, it's, it's an inconsistent story uh, of the color. Uh, it's as if the person just took a couple of, one color, by the way, he nailed the top up here. It looks like it's brown, not rust. So really what we're dealing with is an attempt at rusting with age, uh, aging with rust, but it's the wrong color. It's inconsistent. And, and there's no pattern going back one slide. There's no real consistent pattern of how it's aging. Uh, so there's, there's that one. So I consider that one a fail. Um, here, I, I, I don't know what the yellow is, um, which is a shame because there's some really interesting rust going on here, very old, uh, and there's some really nice controlled rust weeps. The glazing is clear. Um, the roof looks nice, but I, I don't understand. Uh, I, I don't know this railroad. Somebody help me out. I, I thought it was Norfolk Southern, but because um, of the NS, but I don't know what the I and this, is that, is that a backwards N? I, I don't I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the yellow is, but again, it just does not look real. It looks like this person was doing streaks vertically, not with a brush, but with an airbrush. And it gives you a foggy finish. It's not defined. Water rust weeps are extremely, extremely defined. And those are typically the only vertical streaks you're going to see in a, in a subject. Um, you, really, you don't see fogged out vertical streaks there. So that's why that's a fail in my opinion. Um, this is, uh, yeah, somebody was selling this on eBay and um, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, they're trying and that's fantastic. Um, 
but it's, I mean, obviously they didn't seal up the glazing. Um, we've got vertical things going on here that like a gray, I, I, I don't know, enough said. Um, Dr. Dark visited this one. Um, I don't know, this is a failure. I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, load burden that has spilled uh, and, and has stained dramatically. Maybe that's realistic. I don't know. Um, it looks like a failed attempt to me because we have all these splatters in here. Are those are those rust weaves or is that dirt? We got a couple of really nice looking horizontal scrapes here on, on the side. So I'm taking that color to be implied as dark old rust. And if that's the case, then what is the color up here? Is it rust? If, if it's that much rust coming off of this area, why is this area well by the sea? Why is it so clean? It's inconsistent, so that's a fail. Um, okay, here, um, yeah, the finishing coat on this thing ruined it. The texturing we have on the top of the long hood, it does not look real. Um, it, were they trying to fade it? Uh, this, this green fades to more of a gray and it fades evenly. It doesn't fade blotchy like this. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is the nose fading is inconsistent with the top of the roof fading. Um, and then let's talk about the side of the long hood here. This just looks dirty. It doesn't look grimy to me. Um, and I've never seen the BNSF Herald, uh, Heritage 2 paint scheme weather like this. I've never, ever seen it. And I've seen hundreds of that, of that locomotive in that scheme, both in photos and in real life. Um, and I, I've never, and if the sides are that faded, we would see down here, this is a consistency of the story of aging throughout. Um, usually with this particular locomotive, the, uh, there's a lot of grease blow by from the side compressor tank. And you would see tons of that. If this story of dirt and age and grime were to be believed, you would also see that consistently down here and on the trucks, and we don't. So I would say it's it's overall largely a failure <clears throat> in, in uh, weathering. This piece here was done pretty well. Um, we have some great aging technique uh, here on the tank. Someone's paying attention to the detail that a diesel spill cleans off the grime. So they have this little streak over here by the filler cap. Very important. Here they've captured that greasy blow by from the air relief valve on the uh, on the air tanks. Um, see a little little bit down there. That's just genius. It's a subtle subtle touch, but it's absolutely believable. It's realistic and it's completely effective. The dirty of the grates here is a little foggy for me, but I, I get what they're doing. Kind of works. This is a, over here by the cab where the front windscreen meets the side of the nose over here. That is an oft overlooked detail, but that this modeler picked up on that blew me away. Um, this is something that somebody, they, they, they study this locomotive and its weathering patterns severely. Uh, and, and to catch that is, is genius. Uh, and I really love the way they did the truck. Uh, it's completely believable. It's, it's dirty just enough. Uh, and it certainly is going to be a really, really nice looking model. Uh, I believe that is probably a uh, uh, Fox Valley. They had a very unusual orange and yellow paint. It was a little unproto, but anyway, I digress. Uh, this piece here, that is an O scale model. Um, and uh, they work from a photo. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, the rust weeps are absolutely uh, flawless. And we have a lot of um, burden spill from loading in here. Uh, that's actually dominating the top deck and spilling onto the sides. Great, great attention to detail there. Uh, the truck and the wheels are just phenomenal. Uh, um, I would have clicked, this might be HO, actually looking at this, this uh, pin here um, for the air hose, this might be HO. Heck, that might even be N, now that I'm thinking about it, looking at the size of the grabs. At any rate, uh, they've really handled this model really, really well. Um, here, this is O. Uh, this is Jeremy St. Peter. Um, no, no doubt why he got 2009 uh, MTW Car of the Year. Uh, look at those rust weeps. Um, just unbelievably uh, realistic. 
uh, everything all the way through. Um, it doesn't get better than that in terms of and that might be a rust bucket and maybe there are modelers who never want that on their on their layout and I understand that but in terms of just realistically weathering a subject to the fidelity of a photograph this guy nailed it uh here is another example of nailing it right on money uh just absolutely uh, flawless the rust happening here on the door is phenomenal definitely worked from a photo uh, the patch paint on the side and on the roof, uh, the, the, the rust patterns up here on the roof are just absolutely realistic. Uh, really can't say enough. Uh, newly shopped wheels, um, uh, wheel hubs, uh, nice touch. A uh, little silver tip on the glad hand of the air hose, brilliant, nice touch. Um, here we go, uh, getting back to what not to do. So here on the, on the yellow side of this well car, uh, we see this modeling going on here, this weird texture pattern. Uh, this probably happened because the modeler did not seal or wash the factory paint. Uh, and so there was something on the factory paint that caused the, the you know, let me zoom in a little bit so you can fully appreciate the oops here. Maybe that'll help there a little bit. Um, so there's this, little dark and light splotches. So the dark is the pigment the modeler tried to apply. And it, it, it's as if it was repelling, like putting water on oil. Um, I don't know what the modeler did here, but it's typical of putting pigment on a factory new model without cleaning off mold release or without prepping the undersurface of the model. Um, which is another thing, by the way, that sealing it with matte acrylic or with dull coat, uh, that's a great prep. And when you prep the model that way, you're giving the paint and the pigments of chalk and you know acrylic or, or uh, enamel-based paints or oil-based paints, you're giving some tooth for that pigment to adhere to. Very, very critical, very important. Uh, here up in the upper corner, where the blue arrow is, there's a fingerprint. Oops, busted. There's a full on fingerprint. So the modeler handled this model before they put that, that dark coat on. And we, we literally have a fingerprint right there. Um, that's big oops. Okay, here is, let me zoom out here on this so that you can fully appreciate. There's another fingerprint up there in the corner. Okay, um, least of all, I don't know why the person stacked two models on top of each other to photograph them, but that aside, we have a fingerprint and we have some really, really strange looking coloring going on. Um, I don't know what this person was trying to achieve. Um, I think maybe the box car rolled through a storm of shoe polish. <laughs> maybe that's what it was. Um, here's another bad example of uh, self-made graffiti um, it just doesn't look real and the rusting on the top uh, is an epic fail um, yeah I, I, I don't know what they were trying but it failed um, this was uh, it's not horrible but it, 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 it's lacking believability in my humble opinion um, it's done by a very credible model or two uh, but I don't think it was done from photographs. So we have some rather interesting rust. This rust sweep on the right that crosses over the Y in Pennsylvania, uh, see how it's getting wider and then it thins out again? That's really unusual. Um, you might see that on a building if there is some kind of an outlet here that is somehow or another spilling out a liquid or something that's causing that pattern to happen. But on the side of a boxcar, it wouldn't flare out and get wider and then get narrow. Again, it just doesn't. And look at the source. What, what's happening? Where is that coming from? Why is there so much concentrated rust wheat there? Over here, we have a little bit more of a story, but it's all the same color. So it's like, what's going on? It's all new rust. It's all new rust. And new rust isn't going to fan out in pattern like that. Uh, it just doesn't. Not like that. So that's why I consider that a failure. Um, this here is absolute win. Everything about it. 
everything about this model here is an absolute win. This might be Tom Mann, who's a brilliant and skilled, very, very, very well respected uh, modeler. I think this is Tom Mann. I'm not sure, um, but everything about it, um, it looks like it's 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 a yard goat. It it's um, it's very dirty from being in service. Um, there's not a lot of rust because it's it's upkeep uh, and its use prevents it from getting super super rusty. It probably spends a fair amount of time indoors as well. Uh, in a steel plant or something like that, but it just looks absolutely believable. We looked at this earlier. Uh, the detail of this rust work is is phenomenal. Uh, and everything that this individual did here uh, really, really tells of a story. And and the color of the rust weeks are consistent. Uh, these are mine. We looked at these. These were all done from photos. This series of gondolas. Um, okay, I'll I'll let the model speak for itself. This is mine. Uh, gouache rust weeps off these uh, walkway stanchions. Um, the color is a little less than believable. I'm looking at this now kind of going, yeah, it tells a story, but I don't like the color now. I would probably go back in and redo that, but that is my model and it's one of my earlier works. Uh, so is this Procore. Um, again, the, the, the orange is too bright. Uh, it needs some of the darker, darker color. Uh, and the trucks, yeah, not necessarily blowing me away because look how dark the wheels are. So I'm completely inconsistent here. The trucks tell one story. The wheels don't match the story of the trucks. And I didn't do anything on the underside that adds any age to the bottom. So, you know, hit or miss. Uh, I can cr criticize my own work and say that that's, uh, that's not done. That model is not done. This one, you know, uh, a little bit better. Uh, this is another one of mine. Mostly just con wash, a um, little bit of a little bit of overburden here, a uh, little bit of road grime down here by the trucks, uh, some grime on the underside, and the trucks are done fairly nicely. The top is left alone, uh, ideally uh, uh, because of it, it's, it's just not getting much uh, uh, weathering up there, uh, not a lot of age. Uh, auto rack, uh, this is a micro trains, so it's got the real metal side. Um, just kind of showing some, some dirt, some grind, a little bit of age, you know, um, the top is okay. I've seen tops like that, uh, uh, mostly con wash and relieved, um, trying to go for, uh, there's a photo I was working from, uh, reasonably got in the ballpark of reality there on that one. Um, I think we looked at this one earlier as well. Um, I'm clipping my trip pins, by the way, um. This air hose, I, I just cut them all now. They, they, when you're out on a 15,000 square foot layout, uh, these little pins get in the way, so I clip mine now. Um, I go for functionality over, uh, over the aesthetic there. Um, we looked at that one. We looked at this one. Uh, this is the Rust Weep prototype for me that got everything going. The trucks stink. They, they uh, need to be redone. Uh, the wheel in here looks good. Uh, on the left side, the left truck, the wheel looks good. Uh, okay, uh, decent subject here. Um, I wish we had more light on the wheels uh, because I paid a little bit more attention to the wheels and the trucks, trying to make sure that they're consistently telling the same story. Um, but this is mostly all con wash. A little bit of chalk dust over here for road uh, for grime kicking up from uh, from the wheels. Um, here we go. Uh, one of my better pieces. Um, we got boot scrapes on the ladders here. Uh, the trucks look good. The wheels look good. The side, just decent road grime. Uh, fair, fairly new vehicle on the tracks. Uh, this one, uh, still fairly new, but some graffiti got to it. Um, I, I could not control the, I wanted the graffiti to be a little bit more crisp, a little bit more pronounced. I was using a white Prismacolor pencil to control that. And I had to go over it a few times seal it with matte acrylic, come back over it to try and build up that Prismacolor. It's kind of a waxy based pencil. And, and so it's a little bit difficult to really get it to be uh, super, super thick. Uh, but that was all, all that graffiti was done by pencil, by hand. Um, and I think it works. If you look at the photo, um, where's the road number? 518453, you'll see that we got reasonably, reasonably close to reality there. Um, here we go. Um, 
two more to, uh, two more slides, I think. Um, so top deck, that's uh, all metal. That model is metal, but I uh, did the best I could to try and make it look like wood and then to stain the wood with uh, bits of, of rust and also oil stains. Uh, and all I'm doing there is uh, uh, I, I, I went horizontally uh, left to right across the car to give the wood different looks, uh, like different uh, uh, slats of wood, different different bits of wood. Then I, then I uh, uh, gave it a uniform coat of sand. Then I came back in with uh, some drops of uh, a little bit of uh, black paint and just let it, uh, it might've actually been aim chalk, black chalk uh, diluted with uh, alcohol and dropped it in there to make it look like spills. Uh, and it kind of works. It tells a different story. Um, some of this is done with imagination and some of it's done from working from a photo. So we're a little, little foot in each grave there. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this one here. Um, the, uh, these panels that on the, on the ceiling, or uh, the roof rather, excuse me, where the, uh, the paint peeled away and left behind uh, the uh, uh, galvanized metal. Uh, the effect here is done with a uh, tester's uh, metallic flake gray paint. Uh, it's a, uh, this effect works brilliantly in HO and I really arm wrestled with it in N to try and get the effect uh, to be what it is. And um, it, darn near pulled it off. Uh, it's not perfect, especially when you compare it to the effect in HO scale or above, um, but I got it to work. It looks, uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of proud of this one. A little bit of uh, graffiti and then some, uh, some nice uh, streaking hair and fading of the, uh, the bullseye, the cross, the cross uh, logo of Santa Fe. Uh, if you could look underneath the Porsche here, you, there's a little bit of boot scraping on the paint there and a little bit of boot scraping on the steps. A little bit more visible over here on the other end, on the opposite end, some, some boot scraping going on. Uh, worked a lot from photos on these on a series of, uh, of uh, caboose that I got. So, so that's a walk through mine, and that takes us to about two hours. And I really want to open this thing up now for some question and answers. And um, have I missed something, Bob? Uh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, sir. Did I miss something? Did I? Uh, you 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 uh, were were with us the last time we did this thing. Did I? Uh, anybody uh, opening this up to, uh, you know, uh, any questions, any comments, any concerns, any criticisms? Fire so, away. So, Mike, I think a key thing to underline is that you want to seal between your, um, your different uh, passes, right? So that's, you want to seal the model initially to seal in the, the original factory paint and markings. And then each time you do a layer of weathering, you want to seal it again, right? That is correct. That, that is correct. Especially if, if a layer involves decaling, if it involves extensive rust weep, whether you use the oil or watercolor. Um, you, and, and, and if you get that effect and you really like the way it looks, protect your investment of time, seal it, then do whatever is going to happen next. Maybe it's done. Yep. Maybe you're going to add graffiti, come over it with another layer, use some of the uh, 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 the, the vanity or future floor wax to you know re eliminate silvering. Okay. So, Especially, so yeah, the, yeah. So the, the basically the idea is when you want to fix something you've done, so that make it okay. This is good. Then then you hit it again, and then you can still keep doing more, but um, that way you're not going to wipe out something you did. Um, if you come come through with a solvent base something and and yeah you don't want to mess up what you already have absolutely that that is key uh, that mike, is when, mike when you're using powders uh do you find you have to uh put a little heavier coat of powder on because your uh dull coat then takes away some of that powder effect it, 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 it does, Ron. Great question. Thank you. Uh, everybody has trouble with that. You, you get an effect with chalk and, and it, you know, pan pastels or aim, and it looks fantastic. And then you go to seal it with dull coat or whatever. Um, and, and 
What happened to my chair? Oh. <laughs> where so, did it go? Yeah, you, you, yeah, where did it go? Exactly. It's very, very disheartening. Uh, and, and so maybe what you want to do is, you know, like I said, build it up, sneak up on it. Um, it depends on what you're doing with the chalk. I have found my most successful application of the chalk, uh, if I'm not doing the insides of gondolas, uh, um, is uh, where the wheels kick up. It's a very subtle effect. Where the wheels are kicking up some road dust, hit it a little bit, you know, knock it down. Um, again, I, I've seen dull coat out of a can seems to evaporate chalk work a bit more than airbrushed sealer. Okay, whether that's dull coat or whether that's matte acrylic, airbrush because you can lower that pressure. You can really control the pressure and the flow, uh, and so you you you're not obliterating your chalk work as much. That's another reason why I don't like cans. Again, you can't control. You you cannot control. Uh, so yeah, but absolutely that happens. Sometimes the chalk work completely goes away, and you have to reapply it. And and I've had that happen. I've had brilliant looking streaks of exhaust on the top of a locomotive. I've had grime on the sides of, of rolling stock or whatever. Tankers. Oh my God. I had a white tanker and I was doing that yellow. Have you ever seen that yellow effect on the top of a white tanker that just beautifully patinas the entire and it fades away as it comes off to the side of, of the tanker? I had it looking, oh, it was just perfect. Sealed it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> anyway, great question. Anyone else? Well, Mike, um, uh, track. I didn't get to track. Uh -oh. go, go ahead. Ask your question. You got. We got. Oh, okay. Uh, I had. Uh, I told you I went to that um, weathering clinic at one of our uh, regional conventions. So quite a few years ago, and I got the car in front of me, but I don't know how well it's going to show up. I don't know. Can you see that? There we go. Uh, and the thing I wanted to point out was the roof. And I don't know how well you can see it because I'm only seeing a very small picture. What they showed us on on this was we painted uh, the roof silver, and I can't remember exactly what silver. Then we put um, uh, painted the gouache color we wanted, and then we used Q-tips and rolled the Q-tips across it to uh, take some of the gouache off in places. So I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but I was really happy with that. And it's been, it's been hard for me to reproduce that. But when it was done, they, then they went ahead and resealed it. Um, yeah, or I should say sealed it. And I guess it was a dull coat. Nice. That's probably I, I, the best job I've ever done with an instructor. <laughs> I'd love to see some still photos of it. It looks brilliant. Uh, just in the resolution of the imagery that we have right now. And, and, and uh, yeah, it looks phenomenal. I would love to see some good still photos of that. So the, the contrast wash process is, it, let me double back to this because we're, we're uh, what, uh, I, I'm sorry, what, what is your name? I know your name is not Galaxy oh, S21 Ultra. Yeah, uh, it's a a Andy Keeney. Oh, Andy. dear Andy, okay. Andy, yeah, thank you. Yep, yep. <laughs> so the, the method that Andy's talking about is is a an additive subtractive. Okay, it's you add something and then you pull it away, and that's much like the contrast wash, right? We do the wash, we slop on the paint, then we the art is in the removal of the paint you don't need. And in this particular case, the art is using a I've never heard of using a Q-tip before, but that's fine. It's going to soak up the the paint and it's going to give you a texture. Okay, sponges. I don't know about a cosmetic sponge uh, about removing, but regular kitchen sponges. Uh, it's an old artist watercolor trick to remove uh, uh, paint. It gives you a very random pattern as you pull pigment away. So that's an excellent technique. Whatever you try and use uh, to pull it away, it, 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 it's in the random texture of the material that you're re relieving or removing with. And that's going to be the success there. Um, by all means, yeah, that sounds like a remarkable technique. And and uh, you know, this 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 sport, this this art, <laughs> it's as much about um, an experimentation times as much as it is uh, uh, doing what you know works. Whether you learned about what works at a clinic or from a friend or somebody in your club or 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 whatever. Um, 
So, you, you know, here's this method A and, you know, oh yeah, method B works and method C. What if I try a little of this or a little of that? What if I used this to remove it? What if I use that to add it, you know? Um, so that there's, there's no hard and fast rule, uh, you know? Um, don't be afraid to experiment, but make sure you're doing it on a cheap car or maybe it's a car that used to be expensive and along the lines you've trashed it, right? Don't don't experiment on on a, a case in point. First time I was putting grab irons on, I was doing it on a brand new Cotto Dash Nine, and I'd never ever put grab irons uh, in end scale on anything. And and my buddy Mike there, Disney Disney Mike, darn near clocked me in the side of the head because I was doing it not on a cheap, you know, two dollar show find. But uh, here's here's an experiment. Okay, there are people that literally take hot uh, 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 soldering irons to the sides of HL gondolas and they swell out the the you know like years of overburden they swell out between the ribs i saw somebody doing end scale and they didn't use a hot iron what they did was they took and i this failed this is this is an experiment you can see it they took cyanoacrylate super glue a little bit of baking powder baking uh baking soda whatever baking soda and they and they built it up and it, it doesn't work I'm, I'm not there yet. You can almost see the swells, but it's an experiment. I, you know, I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't care about the car. Uh, I'm going to see if I can't replicate that effect. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, is 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 the, uh, the the takeaway there? We talked about track. Um, let's see if I have something to show you. Uh, I have no track up here. I have no track up here. I can I suppose I could walk us downstairs, but that's, that would be that would be a bad use of time. Um, I mix up a large batch in a two ounce jar uh, that I just generically call road mud, and and uh, if you really look at the side rails, um, obviously the top rails are are, are clean and silver because they're getting run on. It's the side. It's the web of the rail. And it's it's the ties that that get that get that uh, uh, weathering, okay? And it's it's a combination of dirt and dust and rust. And it's this weird color. So if you can if you can experiment to get that color, and it would be specific to your region and to your era of modeling, okay? Somebody doing transition era is going to have different looking track than somebody who's doing modern contemporary stuff, right? So um, I became a rail fan in the late 90s, okay? Uh, I lived in Southern California since 72, and I just did not pay attention to all that beautiful blue and, and, and gold uh, Santa Fe and, and the old spill and pollute Southern, uh, Southern Pacific S SP. Uh, you know, I had some of the greatest railroads running through my neighborhoods, and I didn't pay attention until, you know, the late 90s. So anyway, so concrete ties and that mauve ballast, and it, it's this really weird yellowish rust color, okay? So you mix up whatever your steel is gonna be looking like, okay? Specific to your road, to your region, to your era. Mix up a batch of it, okay? Now, you take a cloth t-shirt, old Jersey t-shirt material is great for this. Take a, a piece of wood, little thin block of wood, and you tautly wrap the wood with the cloth. Take some old like three-in-one motor oil. Maybe you've got an old tube of lube oil for your locomotives that you don't use anymore, but you still have it in your, on your workbench. And you soak the jersey cloth with the oil. And you gently wipe it across the rails, the top of the rail heads. Okay, this works for HO. It'll work for N. I've done it in N. I've, I, I've never done it in anything larger. The technique should work, okay? Um, so you want to get a, a, a good oil layer on top of the rails, and that is now a liquid mask, okay? So with the, with the railheads oiled, you take your brush. If this is your, let's see if I have a ruler or something. Hey, piece of track, Mike. Hey, track. Um, yeah. Oh, gods. All right, 
we will simulate the process with this ruler. Okay, we're just going to envision that this ruler is our rails. We're going to come in at a low angle, like 10, 10 to 15 degrees off perfect horizontal. And we're going to airbrush right across. And what we're doing is we're getting the side web of the outer rail and the inner rail on this side. And we're going to go to the other side and replicate that process. Okay. We might even come zenith and do a little bit of color that way. Okay. That's going to dry. But before it dries too much, we're going to do the same thing with cloth on a piece of wood, but this cloth is going to be absolutely clean. And we're going to just wipe that top layer off the top of the rails. No abrasives, no solvents. That top layer should come right off. And I would work, uh, I found success working about three feet a track at a time. Okay, about three feet. What that does is it gives you a reasonable amount of time for dry. You want to kind of get it so that it doesn't completely tack up. A lot harder to remove the paint that way, even though it's on an oil mask. Uh, and and you, you wipe that oil mask away. Then, and this is a little controversial these days, there's all sorts of theories and opinions about what you clean your rails with. Some people swear by Windex. Some people swear by uh, alcohol. Other people will like, no, you can't. Alcohol chemically treats the brass rail badly and then it opens it up for more grime and you know there's all sorts of controversies ask 12 people you'll get 14 answers uh so anyway i i, I use a little bit I, I if the rails come clean without anything great i will still take a little bit of alcohol i'm an alcohol person um i'll put a little bit of alcohol on there and it gets rid of that oily film and done other people have used windex or some kind of a window cleaner uh, as opposed to uh, the alcohol, because they just talk about that, you know, alcohol is an acid. Um, pardon me, I did not silence my phone. That is very rude of me. Um, so there you go. Uh, it's a relatively simple, uh, uh, very smart use of time to, to do your track. Uh, should you do all of your track? If it's a home layout and you've got, uh, you've got track that's, you know, six, eight, nine feet away from the fascia, you're not going to see it. I don't think you should really do the, <laughs> what's, what's the actor from Mission Impossible, hang yourself from the ceiling and <laughs> climb back there and, and, and weather. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that's worth the effort. Um, Tom Cruise hanging from the, you know, the Mission Impossible thing there to get to the back tracks of your layout. If you're doing modular, uh, freelance modular of any kind, you know, uh, and scale, whatever you're doing, and track, you only got two feet to work with. So, you know, by all means, you can work both sides quite easily. Um, and and uh, there you go. Uh, and of course you would do that before you've done any of your other uh, uh, scenic development, right? You're not gonna, you don't wanna get that track color all over your grass and all over ground cover that you put down carefully, right? Uh, so proper order there is track goes down, you weather your track, then you start to fully develop the rest of your scenic stuff, right? And then trees go in last of all, uh, after structures go in. Um, we didn't talk a whole lot about structures, but I, I, I think you guys can see and you can interpolate the methods that you would use for a box car or for a locomotive. They're going to translate to the same thing for, for uh, structures as well. Contrast wash, relief. Um, Here's one we didn't talk about. If you take super, super fine granulated salt, like powder uh, for end scale, uh, regular, really, really fine, fine salt would work for HO and above. And you put that salt down and then you come onto it with a watercolor. The salt does some really, really, or you put the watercolor down first and then you tap the salt onto it. The salt soaks up some of that water and it gives you a really cool organic looking texture. Great for rooftops, <clears throat> whether they're angled rooftops or whether they're flat, especially if they're flat. I know that some people take, uh, I've seen two 400 grit paper, uh, 200 grit, depending on, on the scale. And they put that down as a simulated tar paper. It looks really, really cool. As long as it stays down and stays flat when you add other wet media onto it. And I think you should add other wet media onto it because uh, again, look at Google Maps and really look at tar paper grooves 
and, and see how they fade. And we're not looking at black. We're looking at values of light gray to medium gray uh, because the sun is relentless and ultraviolet light bleaches things out, right? So uh, there you go. Any other colors, comments, input? Can't be shy, guys. <laughs> hey, you keep talking about a handout. Where is it? Um, you'd have to consult Bob or Andy. Uh, I have emailed it. Mark, Mark it. sent it out. Mark sent it out with the, uh, the clinic email. It was just one page. No, 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 sir. No, it's, there's, 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 there's two attachments. Yep. And there's a ten, the second one is 10 pages. Ah, okay. I'll go back and check. Yeah, check that. It, it, it's, it's got, got base, Go yeah, ahead, Mike. Yeah, go I'm ahead. sorry. I'm talking over you. I'm sorry. The, the handout has the talking track to what we just went through. I mean, I, I, I tried to hit some of the high points here. There's a lot more detail in the handout. And there's some useful photos towards the end of the handout, which talk about some supplies that I use for these methods. Um, and uh, there's the PowerPoint slides which um, I'm gonna trust that I did not really blow through anything. We missed the slide on Yoda. Um, uh, Yoda simply says, do or do not, there is no try. So, uh, you know, uh, all in uh, on weathering. Um, I, I think, you know, getting back to one of the very first things I was saying, um, not that model railroaders are impatient. We just have a lot more to do with our models than simply creating it and setting it aside. By the way, uh, on that, I, I, I didn't talk about weathering brass, okay? That is an art form best left to somebody who is absolutely an artisan, a craftsman, somebody that has experience. Due to the cost of brass and, and due to the rarity of some brass pieces, you really wanna send that sucker out to somebody who knows what they're doing and has the experience. You have to pre-treat the brass. You have to clean it, right? That's the pre-treatment. Then you have to prep it for paint. Then you have to paint it. And it's uh, it's not easy. It is not. Uh, I was scared and waved off of that way back when. <laughs> uh, second weathering clinic, I think the, the topic came up. Um, would I ever try it? I don't know. I've inherited uh, four or five brass locomotives from my uncle, Terry. Uh, God rest his soul. He worked on the Manhattan Project. Neat guy. Uh, lived in Long Island. And he and several of his friends had uh, a railroad layout that in the 70s was featured in all the magazines. They had like three guys in the club that were with AT&T. So they had incredible wiring and they had a fast clock. And, and it was amazing. I, I saw the layout once. and He had this fleet of brass locomotives and I've got some of them. Um, I don't know that I would ever touch them to try and, and repaint some of them. I, I'm looking at it thinking, I guess when I was a little kid, when I saw the layout, the paint jobs looked remarkable. Now I look at it and I'm like, geez, Terry, what did you use? Glidden house paint? <laughs> it's quite chunky and quite thick. But, you know, uh, could I ever do it? Maybe. I don't know. I'm sure there's, you know, Google how to paint a brass locomotive. And, and uh, you know, um, I'm sure the processes are out there. And, you know, if I was independently wealthy and I could afford to go spend $500 on a brass model, and then I would maybe try and paint it myself. Uh, but ain't gonna happen, uh, ain't gonna happen. I, I have far too much, I have to buy a 3D printer. And uh, as Bob mentioned, mentioned, the California steel industry is uh, 18 and a half feet of uh, steel plant. I have a lot of 3D printing to do and it's gonna get pricey. So anyway, um, good questions. Uh, any, other, any other comments, uh, track? Uh, where's my little cheat sheets here? Uh, coal hoppers, uh, uh, fear of Loki's. Um, I didn't really go into that a whole lot. Um, there are some really good lessons online about how to take a locomotive apart. Um, I know we spend a lot of hard earned money on locomotives, uh, fixed income or otherwise. And the last thing we want to do is take a, a $235 scale, scale trains locomotive and pop that sucker open. Uh, I've got now, I think, five uh, scale trains. And I'm really sitting there looking at them going and going, I, I know I'm going to weather it uh, any day now. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, talk about fear. Good time to interject to bring in this project. 
so my local hobby store in Southern California was was owned by a gentleman named Jerry Keys. Great guy. And one day you're going to read about this project in a magazine because uh, this is the winter where I have taken an oath to finish this project. What we have here are six CNO locomotives, SD40s. It's the same locomotive. And what we're doing with this project is we're going to weather it in over its 35 year lifespan. So um, I'm going to embarrass myself here, but truth is what it is, and I can't run or hide from it. This project came into my lap in 2009, and it has sat like this for a long time because Jerry had these locomotives custom painted by a guy across the country somewhere in the bread basket. I don't know. Uh, and uh, he just wanted me to, you know, put a little weathering on there. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that for you, Jerry. Um, Milepost 38 was like like the like the the TV show Cheers. Like you'd walk in the door and everybody would be Mike, you know. That was that was my place to go, man. It was a fantastic, fantastic place. Everybody knew your name. And Jerry trusted me. Uh, my weathering guru, Bob Tico, passed on this job and said, talk to Mike. He's my best student. So I'm really flattered and I was really naive. And I said, sure, Jerry, I'll do it for you. And so I start looking at the four photographs that Jerry gave me as as photographic uh, uh, reference and there wasn't enough photographic reference. So I went online and I looked up the locomotive and I started getting dozens of photos and then I started studying them and I thought, holy bleep, I really stepped into this one. The, the problem or the challenge, I should say, not the, not the problem. Uh, the challenge has given me a problem. The challenge is to take a rust sweep as it appeared 35 years ago and watch how that one rust weep has aged and grown and gotten darker and how other rust weeps have appeared and how they've aged and grown and gotten darker throughout the life of this locomotive and you know to when it was patch painted to be csx and you know the roof got patched here and, and it, this was done there and it's like man this you know how, how am i going to do this so you know, here I was earlier saying to avoid an assembly line, the only way to do this is to set up an assembly line so that when I do this one rust weep, I have to magically recreate that exact rust weep here and here and here and here, and then go back to version number two and make it a little darker and replicate that across the other, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm thinking, man, if I screw these up, Jerry had them custom painted, you know, they were custom decaled and oh my gosh. I, I, I can't screw this up. That fear absolutely gave me modeler's paralysis, right? Paralysis by analysis, right? How many times have we heard that one? I was absolutely terrified to even open these models up, let alone start the painting process. So I moved to Vegas in 2012. They were still in one piece at this point in time. And I meet a modeler named Carl Androsco, one of the greatest end scalers and modelers, period period. Uh, and Carl heard about the project and was ridiculously excited about it. And Carl started talking me into doing things like, um, well, you, you know, with all that effort, you can't just stay with the plastic. You got to pop those out and put brass fans in there. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at this project and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. And um, so I'm like, okay, I, I'm not going to go put brass fans and all of these okay first of all it's, it's it's expensive and i'm not getting anything for this i'm doing this as jerry as a favor uh now carl is giving me the poke in the ribs you know and he's like, dude you've got to get this thing done don't over stop overthinking it so um i went ahead and i started the process i took the locomotives apart i can't even touch it with my own fingers right now because that'll violate my prime directive they're dusty um but so i start with the matte acrylic, and I realized on the first pass of matte acrylic that I had a bad batch of matte acrylic and I almost fogged out all six mo locomotives. So I stopped what I was doing and I haven't resumed yet. I, I have a, an elaborate uh, uh, Mr. DIY here. I made myself a foam core spray booth and it was powered by brushless computer fans and I've got photos of it and the whole thing. And version one kind of worked. I put bigger fans on it for version two. I got a little bit more airflow. It's still not working. And 
I want to get going on this, but right now I'm held up by the lack of progress on my spray booth. I'm trying to, to, to build a spray booth where I can have a motor that won't be subject to uh, sparking a, 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 a plume fire or a little explosion because I'm spraying alcohol or solvent, uh, uh, be it lacquer thinner or testers and amyl thinner uh, through there. So I'm gonna create a, a flue and a motor at the bottom and the flue will go straight up like a chimney and the, the draft will come into the side so that the fumes are above the fan and uh, the fan won't ever come in contact with fumes, touch wood. Um, so that's my next project is to finish the spray booth. Then we'll get going on these again. And I'm gonna probably open up a weathering blog um, uh, and track the process of this. Uh, boy, I tell you, right? This is not one project, it's another. I'm, I'm, I'm looking now at a 800 or $1,200 uh, resin printer. Um, uh, I don't know if it, maybe uh, Bob can show the link on Facebook. Uh, and, and anybody who wants to just take a quick look at, at, at CSI. It's not the greatest module set that anybody's ever built, but it's pretty epic for me. Um, uh, 32 switches and turnouts and touch controls and very honored to have Bob work it and uh, not walk away frustrated that nothing worked. <laughs> but it was rather, great, Bob. You, you, you and Tyler seem to have a genuine great time with it, and, and we I, did. We I'm did. still tickled. I'm still tickled about that. And uh, yep. yeah, I've not done anything with it since. Yeah, you, you need to you need to get yourself a printer, but you need to you need to finish this project. That that project, I want to see it now. I'm I'm going to echo Carl and say, get on with it, man. Do no, do not. <laughs> yes, yes. There is no try. Get it done. I, and that, that, that is it. You know, I've, I've got my slide from Yoda there. There is no try, do or do not. So it, it, it's time to do. And uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. it, it it's a pretty serious. Any of you, if you've got other questions, you know, down the line, you, you want to hit me up. Uh, Bob has all my contact information. Andy has my contact information. Uh, please give me a call. Emails in the hand, your email address is in the handout. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. And, you know, uh, like I, think I said earlier, you know, again, respects to all cat owners. There's, there's, there's more than hundred ways to skin a cat, you know, and, and um, people that use it, we like what we know and, and, and people that know dull coat, they love it. Uh, there's a guy that, that uses Krylon clear. Uh, please. <laughs> again, you, you don't know what the formula of the chemical is. You can't control the pressure. You can't control the spray pattern. And pulling it away and spraying it is not really controlling the spray pattern. Um, you, you're playing, you're rolling the dice. Even though I live in Vegas, you know, you're rolling the dice with how much of that pigment's going to hit if you get that far away. Now, if you're doing something that needs a sealer on a huge scale, you've got a forest of trees, and, you know, maybe that works. You know, that's fine. Maybe you put down um, ground cover on this whole area and you really want to seal it. That, that's probably a great use for Krylon. You know, Krylon crystal clear, flat. Um, please use flat, at least, if you're going to do that. Because um, light, nature doesn't shine off of botanicals, like, <laughs> or buildings, for that matter. Okay. Um, I, there was a gentleman in Southern California named Bob Shafro. Great guy. Uh, he used to put together home tours in very, I think he had five different regions in Southern California, almost as far south as San Diego and as far north as Santa Barbara. And from the beach coast all the way out to almost you know, San Bernardino County. And he would have these five shows and it would be a self driving tour. And he would, you know, 20 different modelers in this area would open up their homes to share their layouts. And for years, I would go on these layouts and see these remarkable, some of them were toy trained, you know, O-gauged, that's great. I, I, just enthusiasts having fun with their trains. Another guy not only had this incredible O-scale layout, but he had the most impressive GI Joe action figure dioramas, insane, insane. I, he wasn't married, <laughs> surprise, but they would share us the, and, and, and just walking through and seeing all of this effort done by all of these modelers in N scale, HO, uh, HON3, ON30, uh, G scale, all this stuff. And you, you come to develop a generic level of respect 
for what everybody's doing and the various expressions of this hobby. Um, and you know, we, I, I think those of us that are serious model railroaders trying to scoff at the toy train people and the toy train people don't quite understand the passion of rivet counters. And somewhere in the middle there, you, you have people that, you know, they're, they're doing a little of this and a little of that, and, but they're having fun with the hobby. And in today's day and age, in today's political climate, for crying out loud, folks, life is too short, you know, have fun with your hobby. Um, have fun with your hobby. So I double back to reach out to me if you got any questions. Um, you know, I, I, I'm passionate about weathering. Um, I'm passionate about the wiring underneath my modules. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about putting something out there that makes somebody go, wow, you know, you, you did that? And I'm kind of like, yeah, I did that, I guess. Um, it's not an ego thing. You know, it's, it's, um, uh, it, it's just for passionate love of the sport, you know. Uh, um, and another another anecdote, and I, I think you guys could probably relate to this. Uh, Thursday night, and I was going to go run trains at a buddy's house up in Yorba Linda, California. And, and so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, this is great. My wife's letting me go out and play trains on Thursday night, you know. And so I load up all my locomotives and my rolling stock, and I'm in my car, and and I'm thinking, ah, she, you know, she's what an incredibly supportive wife, you know. I'm going to go out there and just have a little beer session with my buddies and we're just going to put our trains on a dog bone and, and just loop around and we're going to have a beer and talk about life, family and our jobs and the pursuit of happiness, you know? And, uh, and I'm thinking, boy, you know, this, this hobby is really expensive. Gosh, and I'm, I'm thinking, and as, as, I'm, as I'm cogitating this in the left turn pocket next to me pulls up a, a, a black Chevy dually pickup truck. And I look over and I'm like, wow, you know, everything's chromed. If it's not black lacquer, it's chromed. It looks remarkable. And it's pulling an auto hauler. And on the back trailer is a 57 Bel Air, Chevy Bel Air, funny car. And again, if it's not black lacquer, it's chrome, including the rather prodigious blower sticking out of the hood. That's, you know, it's sticking out of the hood by a good two feet. And I look over and I'm thinking, I don't feel so bad about my hobby. Those camshafts easily, easily could pay for everything I have in my car right now. <laughs> so, you know, one person's ceiling is another person's floor. Um, uh, another story, uh, out here in Vegas, uh, some of you may have heard of a guy named Chris Kilroy who was building Tehachapi Loop and N scale in his three-car garage. And after he built all the bench work and all the track, he realized that it wasn't right. So he punched a hole through the powder room, which connects the garage to the den of the house. He goes through the powder room into the den and he had a double peninsula island and a duck under, it goes back into what was the coat closet into the, I'm sorry, it went through the laundry room into the den, comes back in through the powder room. He even built a beautifully ornate oak shelf so that when you're, when you're in there on the John, you know, here comes a train coming through and it's, it's, it's at eye level on this little shelf and it goes back into the garage and it was a big giant helix. Uh, uh, Carl and I had a conversation. Love Chris. Great guy. Fantastic modeler. Uh, really, really seriously committed. Um, but Carl and I got to talk to him one day. He was here, you know, he about 30 minutes from my house in Vegas here uh, in Henderson. And uh, Carl and I would go over there and operate and, and uh, you know, roughly roughly estimating easily 100 grand for rolling stock and, and and all the computer controls and all of the track and all of the lumber and uh chris had a, a serious life change and tore it all down sold you know sold everything that he could on ebay or on, in other other circles and tore it down and and the guy got hate mail he got you know short of death threats um uh, yeah it's <laughs> Look, life, life turns and, and, and you, you got to sometimes, you know, answer a different call. But um, uh, the, the, the point is the varying degrees to which we commit to the hobby, right? So uh, bringing that back down to weathering, you know, if you, if you spend $250 on a, on a DCC sound locomotive, um, reach out for the answers if you don't know how to take it apart. There's somebody out there if not in your immediate modeling community, you can find answers online or you can find somebody who's done it, who's been there and can, you know, metaphorically hold your hand through the process of taking it apart. But I would say take it apart because 
you don't want to try and weather a locomotive of any kind, let alone when it's $250 or $300, or if it's a collectible, you know, a $500 locomotive, you don't want to try and do it with all of its parts together. First of all, you're going to drive yourself crazy masking off window glazing and masking off trucks and, and the overall product will not be as nice as if you went through the effort of taking it apart, doing what you have to do, and then reassembling. It's, it's paramount. It's, it's key. So uh, th 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 that's, that's my last uh, uh, plea on that one. Um, find some cheap models. Uh, experiment. If you've got any questions, reach out and call me. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to make myself a resource to you. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It was a very interesting and enjoyable program. I think everybody learned something. I'm very interested in this uh, Tamaya grill paint, the panel paint. I'm going to get some of that. It, it's it, it really, really looked great. Uh, Alexis uh, totally sold me on that. Um, and I have the Broadway Limited, and uh, it, it's got little panels and little little bits and pieces here and there, and I, I may use it there. I, I may actually go and use it. It's it's premixed, ready to go right out of the bottle, and, and, and I'm really it's I'm good for it. screens. Is that right? The the grill areas is good for them. They they call. I'm going to do a quick Google search on this thing here because uh, I want to find out. Uh, tell me. Uh, Panel wine accent. Oh, it's, so, it's a wine. How, how about as far as the actual uh, the grills? I thought it was used for grills. Uh, it is. See. It is. They're so using the grills also. Right. I think predominantly this was developed as a military. And so you've got, I mean, guys used to do, or people used to take uh, 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 quill pen ink inkwell oh, okay. and they would they would get a little drop applicator and it would run along the panel seam of the flap on a mustang or it would it would settle in along the the lines of have you seen somebody model the millennium falcon from star wars and i've seen okay. modelers that do these space models where they're using all these different grays to get that look the john dykstra uh, you know uh silent running um before Star Wars, you know, the way they would prep these models to shoot them in cinema, they would take black well ink and they would put it to, to, to run along all these panel lines and it would contrast the panels and, and things would pop, decals would pop, suddenly you could see them better. And right. that, that, that was the whole genesis of the contrast wash thing. So to me, it makes this thing up. It's a really, really thin black and they call it panel line accent color because it was made to, to pop, but I promise you, if you use it, if you've got like a, a streamliner and it's silver and it, you know all those window mullions and all those side panels, if you put that black everywhere and, and just to pop, uh, it's not gonna look real in HO or O or N, it's not gonna look real. So I, I, would, I would really throw up the caution flag and use it just on, for model railroading, I would use it for, uh, uh, um, Gosh, I wish I had pictures of Alexa's work. It really, really sold me. But it just looked look great. It Basically, really, it'll work well for uh, for the for the grills for the, yes. the screened areas on the side of the bodies of the locomotives. Absolutely, okay, great. That's what I mean. If, if you have like uh, anybody doing uh, fruit from transition era, the uh, doing what uh, fruit fruit uh, refrigerators? Oh, you know, okay. Have, the mechanical reefers, they have those little panels in the back. You know, that would be a great application for it. Um, okay. Tunnel motors, uh, you know, diesel tunnel motors. Um, sure. You know. Switchers. Yeah, yeah. So wherever you've got a panel that, that, that's something mechanical is behind it, something's breathing, equipment needs to breathe, and you got a panel in front of it, great use for it. Yeah, great. okay. Very good. So does anybody else have any uh, questions for Mike? Are you all set? No, no questions. So, well, it's almost four o'clock, so <laughs> probably. Way to go, Mike. Yeah, no, good job, Mike. I really appreciate it. We, we got our money's worth. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, my, so. my clinic seems short now by comparison. 
<laughs> yes. Put the two together, it's an 